Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Welcome to the Annie and Elston Show. I am Annie Heilbrunn. Craig Elston off today, a much needed, much deserved day off. I believe he is out somewhere on a golf course, maybe having more luck than Xander Shoffley did yesterday with one more shot needed to win that players tournament. But I'm happy to be here joined today with Braden Suprenant. Braden, hello. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, Annie. Doing well on a Monday morning. Ready to go. Ready to attack the day. Ready to talk some sports. Fired up about March. It's March. It's March. It's March. We get to officially play that song as the NCAA tournament seating announced yesterday. And we're going to talk all about that and the Aztecs and the Mountain West and everything that has to do with those seatings and all the controversy and hubbub around those. So I'm excited to get to that, but we'll also be talking a lot of Padres. We are T minus two days until opening day for the Padres 2024 season, where they will open against the Dodgers in Korea, a two game set there during what is really <laughs> spring training, but Hey, it's all good. I'm getting excited for regular season baseball. You Braden. Yes, I uh, I finally got to get a little bit of a taste of that last night. I tuned into the game. I finally figured out how to. I wanted to make sure I could log in to the. It's been tough with like doing the show here to like yes. log in on the Padres.tv and our TVs in here are not necessarily the smartest TVs. Uh, so I haven't really been watching a lot of those, but I got to tune in last night, see everybody on the broadcast with the mustache and on a Peter Seidler, which <laughs> yes. is great. Dylan Cease making jokes about him being very small in comparison to Bob Scanlon, but everybody is small in court <laughs> next to Bob Scanlon. <laughs> Dylan, you should you should know how I feel standing yeah. next to Bob. I mean, he's like a skyscraper. But, I, love, I love that Joe Musgrove is like, you know what? I'm fine. I don't need a stool. He's satisfied. Guys. Yeah, yeah. He's good. Joe's <laughs> like, come on. All right. <laughs> but it was cool to, to finally get to see, you know, like a real lineup. You get to see, you know, the energy in Korea is always very, very fun when you see the international baseball. Um, it's just a little bit different than Major League Baseball. Obviously, it always everything feels like the World Baseball Classic right. uh, when you play internationally. So that, it was pretty fun to see see the guys go out there and, and compete. Get to see Dylan Cease for the first time, and that was my first real like. All right, it's time to it's time to start playing some real games. Let's 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 uh, let's throw it out to uh, on Wednesday and get ready to go. Yeah, same here. After those two exhibition games, now I am also itching to get the regular season started. And guess what? They are at 3 a.m. on Wednesday morning. There is a watch party hosted by Ben and Woods, although I'm sure other members of the 97.3, the fan family, will be joining them at Seven Mile Casino. So you can, of course, watch from there or from the comforts of your own home and listen to it on the radio as well. Jesse Agler and Tony Gwynn Jr. making the call. So a lot of good stuff there coming up. But we're going to talk all about that. We're going to talk about the exhibition games. Dylan Cease, Jackson Merrill, the latest on him. Tommy Pham, the latest on him. We're going to get to everything surrounding the Padres. We've also got a lot of Aztecs talk on the basketball side, but also on the football side. I met Sean Lewis, head football coach, last week. Braden, you know him as well, right? I got to meet him at an NIL event, um, you know, when he first got hired within the first, I think, week or two. Um, got to talk to him for a little bit, you know, from the media standpoint, but also as a, you know, from the high school coach, college coach conversations as well. So um, I'm fired up about Sean Lewis. I think it's a great hire. The more I got to talk to him, the more I believe it's a great hire and the things that he can do to really move the not only the football team, but the athletic department in a good position for success, especially in the ever-changing landscape of college athletics. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what he can do. And, uh, you know, I, I I think they're they're in really good hands with Sean Lewis. The, the only downside is he might do such a great job that he might not be here very long. <laughs> um, but, I, again, I don't want to overhype him. He's, he's taking over a program and trying to re-energize the football program. But they got the resources they got the stadium and now they got the coach. It's going to be fun to watch in the fall. Exactly. So we're going to we're going to break that down more. Uh, I'll go over a little bit about my experience meeting him and then we're going to talk a little bit about what he told us at our sports association luncheon about NIL, the way that he's going about recruiting the new and ever-changing college landscape, which of course Braden knows a lot about as well. So a lot of fun topics planned too. We are going to get to some unique ones, some interesting ones. And then we have Bryce Miller from the San Diego Union Tribune who will be talking with us at 1:30 p.m. Our time, which is actually Bryce's Tuesday morning. He's going to get up early. It's going to be 5.30 a.m. 
Tuesday morning in Korea to talk with us. And Bryce is, of course, a columnist for the San Diego Union Tribune. He's been doing great work getting what we call in the industry color, which is kind of a lot of the off the field, off game stuff the culture, the sights, the sounds. He followed around ha Sung Kim for a day. He met his parents. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get into all the the cheerleaders, the food, the everything like that. But then Bryce will also be able to talk about the players and what they've been doing there and acclimating. So I'm really excited that he's calling in and happy and thankful that he's willing to wake up early for us because I did try someone else who will not be named before I knew Bryce was there and got big time. Didn't even didn't even get a response. So, oh, my um, not, God. not from the Union Tribune. Yeah, oh, so no. Oh. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm going to get a text a few days from now, you know, when they're all back in um, yeah. from Korea oh, and it's going to be like, oh, sorry, my Just phone. Saw this. <laughs> yeah, my phone wasn't working well in Korea, but that's right. Bryce got back to me right away. So thank that's you, Bryce. Of, that's the kind of guy Bryce is. <laughs> Bryce Miller is my go to guest every time I, I uh, guest host shows. I always yeah. put Bryce on because I always know I'm going to get a good conversation out of Bryce Miller because there's so many different directions you could go with Bryce because as a columnist, you know, he's not just covering one sports team, you know, religiously on the beat. I mean, mm -hmm. he has different opinions on different things and, you know, you can, you can throw a, diff a bunch of different topics off of him. Now, that being said, he does like it when you send him topics beforehand, <laughs> but I, every time I go, Bryce, I'm not going to ask you anything that you aren't going to be exceptional on answering yeah, so exactly i'm looking forward to talking to bryce later. exactly and we're gonna probably stick pretty closely to what he's been writing about in korea i'm sure that he's uh i'm, I'm sure he's paying attention to what's going on with san diego state but i don't know how closely we can always feel him out on that and uh, get his opinion there too but a lot of good stuff planned um good weekend for you brayden i'm guessing you worked i worked yesterday for my show but that was it i didn't have mm -hmm. Any USD obligations. I did work on Friday night. I got mad at Rutgers, by the way. Rutgers softball. Mm. I was very disgruntled with their antics, I should say. They started the game off, and right before the game started in softball, it was the USD Rutgers softball. I I was... It, the, the home plate umpire, um, who actually goes back and watches the broadcast, he complimented my broadcast. I was like, well, thank you. I'm, I'm not going to keep it easy on you now for you... You're saying that, but He's that being said, to you up. yeah, exactly. Uh, but that, that being said, uh, he said, he told the facilities guy right before first pit, it, the, the batter's box is a little off. Like it was just a little bit tilted or something. I don't know. It was a little off is what he said, but mm -hmm. it wasn't a big deal. Okay. And the foul lines were everything about the regular field of play was fine. Rutgers hits in the top half of the first inning and they scored two runs and they have a really big inning. And that was after the losing the night before, USD got him in extra innings the night before. And then the Rutgers pitcher starts warming up. She goes through her entire warm-up. They throw down the second. And then the head coach stops the game and said, we won't play until the box is fixed. Ooh. And I was like, what is this BS? I'm like, it was, <laughs> I'm trying not to be like overly dramatic about it, but I, almost on the broadcast, it was, it was fine for them while they were hitting, but now all of a sudden they can't pitch with the box. Like, what's the what's the problem here? I mean, the foul lines were still correct. Annie, there was a 35 minute delay no. as they redid the field after they played the top half of the first inning. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Just play the softball. You want to make a broadcast team mad? It's called delays. OK, that was after, <laughs> by the way, Annie, they gave me their lineup 10 minutes before first pitch. Wow. And right. I was like, all right, Rutgers, you're on my S list. After that, I was very upset. But aside from that, I had a good time. Good. Uh, USD won the first game, lost the next two. Uh, Saturday, I played in a softball tournament. Probably the worst softball player on the on the face of the planet mm. on Saturday. I was so pissed when I left. Uh, we did okay. We did. We went one and two. Uh, shout out to l and I'm sorry I let, I let the boys down. And then I ruined my... I have nasty blisters on my ankles right now because I didn't wear high enough socks for the cleats I have. And mm. so now they're just completely destroyed. All but right. that being said, I had a good time still. Ho hopefully I'm not cut after the weekend I had playing softball. And then uh, I had a good time on the on the show yesterday. I got to talk about a lot of topics and. Yeah, overall, pretty uh, pretty solid weekend. I know that was a little bit longer of an answer than you thought. Well, I like it. You did a great job. I listened in yesterday uh, on the Braden Supreme Show when you That's were right. Yes, from it was eight to ten a.m. yesterday. Is that going to be your normal slot? 
that is forward? my normal okay. normal time slot. It's perfect for as we talked about as I talked about it with Adam. It's a it's a great slot for the baseball season because we'll be recapping the night before, kind of doing the pre pregame show. So, you know, when games start at one o'clock, you're gonna have that. Um, you know, all day Padres coverage on a Sunday after a, a Saturday night game, which we've never had. And then in the in the fall, in the football season, it's I'm the the football guy of the station. It's good to recap college, preview the NFL, get some Padres talk in there as well. And uh, it's going to be my normal uh, Sunday slot. So right. looking forward to that. There are a couple of days I'm going to miss in the next couple of weeks, obviously with, with Easter and some other things. But aside from that, we're we're going to be eight to ten every Sunday. All right, I love it. Uh, great weekend. It's getting sunny out, which you guys know my gripes with daylight savings time last week. Well, I've, I've turned the corner. I've gotten past that. I'm starting to really enjoy the sunshine and the fact that we get to stay out a little longer. Um, so we'll get to all that. You know, we've got what's good coming up in this show as well. And then we really do. We have a busy week. The, the two regular season games, Wednesday and Thursday, um, the celebration of life for Peter Seidler is Saturday of this week. It's this week, right? Yeah, it's okay, yeah, because Fan, Fan Fest, Fest is, is on Sunday, Sunday guys. Correct. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. I felt like it was so far away, and now it's around the corner. So, you know, regular season home opener at Petco Park is a week from this Thursday, I believe. So a lot going on, a lot of exciting things happening, and we'll keep you filled in on all of that. But one thing that caught everyone's attention yesterday, yesterday morning, Bob Nightingale, USA Today, writes this long news and notes column, goes through how the pandemic affected uh, Major League Baseball, obviously, and how announcers used the KBO to keep fans in tune during that time. They called games from their houses, locked into the KBO because they were still playing baseball just to try to stay involved in the game, right? So he's kind of going through, and you're like, this is a nice call. I'm kind of interesting, this and that, right? And then there's this little nugget at the bottom as he starts to get into his tidbits. And it is that the Padres are interested in bringing back Tommy Pham. Now, we've been hearing this all season long. We've been figuring that this might be happening. And he floats out a number, three to four million. Now, Tommy got paid eight million last season. A lot of that could have been incentives or a, a chunk of that probably was incentives, but it kind of made you raise your eyebrows. Okay, are, are the Padres really going to, is he going to sign for three to $4 million, right? Half of what he made last year. And I would think that if he does that, he's got another incentive laid in contract, but I don't know that that's in the tune of 4 million extra dollars, right? Usually that's a few hundred thousand or something like that, yes. that they can make in incentives. And players really don't like to sign that much more in incentives because obviously they're, it's not guaranteed money. But Tommy did turn 36 just, uh, I think, last week. Um, he's getting a little bit older. Clearly, there is not a bidding war over him. So it's, I guess, could be probable that he would take a, a lower salary, a, a, a salary of three to four million. But it started the interest of, is he going to come to the Padres? If so, what is the holdup? And does he make this team better? Now, Braden, I do think he makes his team better, although I'll throw a caveat in there after I hear your perspective. I do think he makes a team better for three to four million dollars. It's not that big of a risk. What are your thoughts on that? It's not a big, you know, the risk reward is, I think, is beneficial. Um, you know, so I, I, I don't, I don't, I think it's a good move for the Padres. And to be honest with you, I mean, from the Tommy Pham perspective, as much as like, I'm sure he wanted more than three to four million dollars. And I know, I know a lot of the holdups with the conversation with the Padres was guaranteed playing time as mm. well, because he wants to be an everyday starter. And, you know, if they bring in Pham, I'm sure they're going to spot start pro far. Right. And, and probably move things around. And, you know, neither Profar nor Fam are real center fielders. I'm sure in a pinch, the Padres would have to throw one of them out there. But the reality is, um, you know, Merrill's going to be starting in center, and those two will be splitting some time in left field in some kind of capacity. And, uh, you know, if I'm Tommy Fam at this point, one, I want to I want to get paid, and two, I want to be able to play. Uh, so that's that's kind of a... A, a, a thing that's holding this this conversation up but on top of that if you're Tommy Pham I mean you know the regular season starts on Wednesday I know it's only just for two teams but within that everybody's going to start within a week after that and then once the once the season starts you know there's not a lot of teams that are looking for for guys I mean they're going to be like, this is our squad this is what we're going to go with and you know all of a sudden you become a little bit more desperate to sign, then you might be only getting one or $2 million. Yeah. So, you know, getting $3 million and 
splitting time is a lot better than getting no dollars and not playing at all. And especially at age 36, I mean, he can't afford to like take a year off, right? I mean, yeah. he, he might just get left behind. And then next year it's, well, we'll invite you to, to minor league camp. So yeah. I would imagine this thing's probably going to pick up very quickly. I would not be shocked if Tommy Pham is signed and will be on the opening day roster for the game against San Francisco. Yeah, I would not be shocked if he's signed and waiting in the clubhouse when the team returns from Korea. Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> but I like all your points. I want to get into a little bit. I will give you my perspective as well after the break. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit also about the exhibition games in Korea and what we've seen over the last two days. So keep it right here. Annie and Elston taking you all the way through 2 p.m. right here on 97.3 The Fan.
Welcome back to the Annie and Elston show right here on 97.3 The Fan. I am Annie Heilbrunn. Craig Elston with a much needed, much deserved day off today. I believe you can find him if you so desire. North course of Torrey Pines. Right I think here? he's playing the north. Is that yeah. what he said? I, now, he did say this on air, so I don't feel bad saying it yeah, to you're not again. ratting him out. <laughs> when Well, before when we were on... One of the days that uh, you were not here, he was mm. like, oh, well, you know, I, I think he got an invite from his buddies because they had a tea time at Torrey North and he wanted to play. Oh. And he was like, I'm going to be sick the day after. I'm going to be sick on the 18th. I'm like, yeah, man, just just party too hard for St. Patrick's Day and then call out sick. But then he 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 ratted himself out last week. Yeah. So it's no longer, it's out in the open. It's no longer yeah. a, a, so, a secret at this point. Yeah, hopefully he's uh, he's having a lovely day. It is nice outside, nice and sunny. Of course, a beautiful golf course over there at Torrey Pines. So enjoying his day and we look forward to having him back tomorrow, but happy to be joined here by Braden Suprenant. We were talking about Tommy Pham before the break and whether or not Tommy is a desired addition to this Padres team. And I think Braden and I both are on the side of, yes, he is. I mean, this is a team that needs more depth. This is a team that really doesn't have any depth. When you've got a guy like Tommy, you've got someone who isn't going to necessarily be the the, the missing piece. I don't know necessarily that he's going to win all the games for you going forward or, or be the MVP at the end of the season, although stranger things have happened. But he takes really good at-bats. He sees the ball well. He's able to give guys looks behind him. Um, he's able to kind of wear down a pitcher. He's another veteran guy in the lineup when you have a lot of, or, or at least a few young guys coming up especially, that he lengthens the lineup. He also gives some more insurance at that either outfield, left field, platoon. I'm not exactly sure how they'd use him yet, whether he'd be starting or not. Position so that you don't have to necessarily rush up someone else or you don't necessarily have to say jerks and profar as your starting left fielder for the season. So I do think it's good. Three to four million, not a lot of risk there. The one thing that I think AJ Preller, and this is where I think he has to make his money because also it is kind of confusing that Tommy Pham isn't signed yet. In my opinion, it's like, what's the, what's, what's the holdup? Braden mentioned before the break that maybe it's that he is trying to find a team that will give him regular playing time. Let him be a starter where with the Padres, he might be more of a platoon guy. But I look at Tommy and I personally see the work ethic in Tommy. A lot of guys spoke so highly of him during his time with the Padres. It was not an easy few years with him, with the Padres, both off the field and on, struggled with injuries. But guys liked him in that clubhouse. However, this is the caveat that I will add. He is different. He is a unique cat. He is someone who is very intense. He's a little bit of a personality that takes some adjustment. He takes a little bit of getting used to. And this is a team that's been working together and talking about camaraderie. And we'll be getting to that also a little bit more later in the show. Talking about camaraderie, camaraderie, togetherness, all spring training. That is like the way that they are hanging their hat for a winning season, at least before the season starts. And so you throw someone else new in there and it is different. It's going to break up a little bit of the familiarity that they already have in that clubhouse at that position throughout that position group. Now, I don't think that this is anything you can't overcome. I don't think that this is anything that can't, you know, be, be, be something that you get used to, that you just adjust. Of course, Mike Schultz has said all season long, they want he wants his team to be elite adjusters. He wants his team to be able to make moves on the fly and not let it completely pummel you and drag you down, which is what happened to this team last year. Again, I, I think Tommy Pham, a good addition. I think that he is a needed addition on this Padres team, especially after all the other guys have come off the board. I know back in San Diego when Tommy played for the Padres the last time, he had a chip on his shoulder about getting that big contract. Everything was working for that big contract, that multi-year contract, that one that sets you up. And he just hasn't gotten it. And I think Tommy will be the first to take responsibility for that. He hasn't had the years. He hasn't put together the resume that has afforded him that. And Braden, you made a good point. 36 years old, you can't take a year off. You can't really, you don't have a whole lot of um, leverage on what you can do and where you can play. So Tommy also has to think, hey, what's my best plan here? What's the best? Because you're really in another walk year. You're in another year where you're trying to set yourself up for age 37 with a team. Yeah, and I think right now it's it's you know you get to a point where 
you know, you get an offer from a place that you're comfortable with. And I think that's a major factor as well. I mean, exactly. obviously, I mean, he lives in Ve- he's from Vegas. He lives in Vegas. It's not it's not a far it's not it's not far from home. Um, you know, he's played in the town before. He's got a good relationship with AJ Prellers, as we have seen, um, you Very know, in, in, in the writings and, and everything. And I'm sure you have you have observed in the clubhouse as really well. Really good with AJ Preller, really good with Mike Schilt, both and, guys. Right. I mean, he was one of the guys that applauded Mike Schilt for getting the job, mm-hmm. right? Because he spent time with him in St. Louis mm-hmm. and obviously some some time, I think at the very end, like the the very end of his time with the early part of Schilt's time in a Padres uniform. And, and the two are still, they, they went to dinner last year when when um, Tommy was in town. I mean, they're still like, they still stay in touch. They're still right. friends. But he's still like, the players loved them when he was on the team too. Yeah. It's not like he doesn't have, you know, and I don't like, I mean, there's, there's so many people in the chat that, you know, watch Tommy play in a game and the guy's intense and he'll, he'll yell. And we saw that episode he had with, with Hassan Kim, but that doesn't mean he, you know, he's a, he's a clubhouse cancer. It's definitely not even close to being true because the players love Tommy fam. I mean, it's funny. The, the players that fans paint as, Oh, nobody in the clubhouse likes him are usually the guys that everybody loves in the clubhouse. As you and I know from being yeah. down there almost every single day, uh, you know, it's it's not what it what it seems like when you watch on TV, listen on the radio, or, right. or observe from the stands. Uh, the players like him, and I think he brings that intensity, as you mentioned, that you know Xander Bogarts brings. And I think the Padres need a couple of those guys. I oh. mean, they they need they need some position players to kind of match that energy that Joe Musgrove has with a good mix of the relaxed players that that you currently have as well. And I think that would be a recipe for success. Again, I think a lot of it has to be uh, playing time guarantees. I'm sure Tommy wants to get as much money out of this as, as humanly possible, but I, I would imagine this is probably the best offer Tommy Pham is going to get uh, where you're on a team that can compete. This is a team that can compete regardless of what we've said with their holes in their team. They're, they're a talented team that can compete. He's played here before. He's comfortable with the organization. It, it seems like a great fit. I, I, I think it's only a matter of time. Yeah, Tommy Pham tends to get hit with a lot of stereotypes that uh, another player might not be hit with if they if they weren't of uh, you know Tommy's skin color if they weren't and I'm not pulling that card here in in terms of just like baseball is racist or things like that but there is a lot that goes around Tommy that if you see another player do it if you see Clayton Kershaw do it if you see uh, a different player throwing a fit or yelling or getting angry you don't necessarily see that same narrative around them that you see with Tommy now I understand Tommy's what did he do slapped Jock Peterson. Uh, I think over some fantasy thing or whatever. Yeah. Guys, who cares? All right. Look, look, this was over. <laughs> this was over. I think Jock calling the Padres like some name or something like that. I mean, it was in defense of the Padres, but I think you make a really good point about the grittiness of Tommy. The thing about it is, is this is a team that needed more of an edge. They just mm-hmm. do. Like last year, you guys all saw it. Pitchers would pitch right whizzing past Fernando Tatis's head or going in on a guy, or sending him to the ground, and you really didn't see any movement from that dugout. Now, this doesn't mean you have to have the bullpens running in every game, but you do need to show a little bit more fight, a little bit more togetherness, a little bit more, we're not going to take that S from anyone. You've got Jerks and Profar, who, by the way, is one of those guys. And then I think you have Tommy Pham, both actually left fielders, I guess. <laughs> that is one of those guys. But Tommy, is not he's not going to take it. He's not going to let you go out there and and mess with him. He's not going to be messed with. And he's not going to let he's not going to let you mess with his teammates. Exactly. Either. I mean, that's a guy that you want on your side, and he's definitely a, one of those ride or die guys. And that's a guy I want in my clubhouse. That's a guy I want in my dugout. That that's going to help the team, and he's going to do whatever it takes to help the team. But I think he's got a lot better after he had the uh, the procedure on his eye too. I mean, yeah. he had the handmate bone it problem. He had the eye uh, issue. While he was here, I mean, he he's lucky to if he wasn't so in great, amazing shape, and so re- he wouldn't even be on this planet right now yeah. with the incident he had uh, off the field. That wasn't even his fault. I mean, that was just something that happened, and he's defending his own self and his own situation at the time, and all of that happened during his time here in San Diego. And since then he has put up some really good numbers as he has finally become healthy and been able to contribute. And at age 36, I'd I'd take this guy, especially at the price tag that was thrown out there by Bob Nightingale, because you could bring him in 
It fills that that outfield spot, right? You filled the last starting rotation spot you probably needed to fill. You got more pitching with the Dylan Cease pickup. You need an outfielder. And with that, I think you could go out there and, and be able to compete. And we've been sizing up teams, Annie, and, and we're going to give our predictions later on in the show. You go through these these rosters and these these teams they're competing with. I mean, the Padres are better than a lot of teams in the National I League, agree. despite maybe not having that star studded lineup as star studded as it was last year. This is a team that's going to be able to be around in the playoffs, and all you got to do is get in. And you can see what happens, but I'm encouraged with what Cease did last night. You had fam to this team. This team is is ten times better. And I said it on my show yesterday. I said it when I filled in for you guys a couple of weeks ago uh, on something that Adam told me. What Doug Gottlieb said: you can't judge something until it's complete. As much as 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 you would like to. And he he brings up the time that they remodeled their house, and his wife didn't like the way it was looking, but it wasn't done yet. And he said, just wait for it to be done. I think the same thing could be said about this Padres team. You can't judge what this team is going to do until it is fully complete, and that might be waiting for Tommy Pham. Yeah, and I, I think that getting Dylan Cease really helped with the confidence going forward, going into this regular season, and Tommy Pham, uh, or adding a player like Tommy Pham would also as well. Um, so we're going to close the book on this a little bit. We'll come back with some talk about the exhibition games. But the last thing I would just say about Tommy is, like, you don't have to like him. You have to just make sure that he is a valuable player. And if the players like him, if he is a fit in this clubhouse, if he's able to help some of these younger guys with their routines, he's really good at that preparation, routines, um, kind of understanding baseball. He has a lot of respect, actually, for just the game of baseball. Now, I'm making Tommy sound here like a saint. He is not. None of them are saints, guys. Even the ones that you think are saints are not saints. So Tommy has his flaws like everybody else. But is he going to make this Padres team better? I believe so. Braden believes so. What do we know? But at this point in time, I think it's a good gamble for them to take. So when we come back, we'll talk more about the exhibition games, the Padres winners in both exhibition games, although uh, Whew, some, some of that offense <laughs> was All suspect right. at yeah. first. But we'll talk about it in games that are undeniably meaningless, except kind of meaningful in, in, in a few spots if you want to take away some silver lining. So we'll get to all that when we come back right here on 97.3 The Fan.
Everyone knows Tony Kornheiser, but to get him unfiltered, check out the Tony Kornheiser Show podcast. The iconic voice of PTI is a roller coaster of wit and wisdom. It's smart. It's funny. It's his unique perspective on the sports world. Unleash your curiosity and join the conversation. Follow the Tony Kornheiser Show on the free Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, Braden, wonderful to be here again. Craig Elston out. He is taking a much needed day off. We are joining you until 2 p.m. After that, the Gwyn and Chris show. After that, the Matt Scraby show, live and local programming through 7 p.m. Braden, I watched both of the exhibition games, as I'm sure many of you listening did. You watched the 3 a.m. one? I, I didn't watch it, it at 3 a.m. <laughs> I was going to say, that's, de- that's some dedication right there. I watched it at more like 7 a.m. when I got up and I looked at it uh, on the MLB app and I'm like, hey, this is the free game of the day. I can watch this, you know, (laughs) so (laughs) thank goodness for that. Um, Padres were 0 for 8 in that first game and we can get into it starting. Let's start on the offense and then let's get into the pitching after that. 0 for 8. It was uh, a little bit of a scary showing. You started to have flashbacks of last year, but I will point out that Pitching is a little different in Korea. Now, of course, you could say the same for the Dodgers, and they started their first game. I think they scored like 15 runs. But, you know, these are two different teams they were playing. The pitching is a little bit different. The velocity on the fastballs, it's slower. It could be a little bit of an adjustment for a player to catch up to in terms of it just being a little different than what they're used to in the States. Um, But the second game turned out a lot better. Two home runs from Ha Sung Kim. The celebration, I'd love to get into that of him returning to his home country, being able to enjoy that with his fans. And you know what? John Morosi from MLB Network had a great note that the manager for the LG Twins was um, Ha Sung Kim's first manager as in in the KBO when he first came up in the KBO. So it was like a full circle moment for Ha Sung Kim. You saw his family there. It was great. But overall, Braden, were you a little bit... Uh, stressed out when he saw that 0 for 8 with runners in scoring position and, and the one run scored. And it was also, by the way, bases loaded, first inning with no, no outs. outs. <laughs> and they got scored on a wild pitch. Tell me your thoughts. Uh, yeah, obviously, that's not ideal. I don't like that too much. But that being said, there's a couple of things that you got to break down with this. You know, these exhibition games in Korea, um, obviously, they're still trying to build up to the regular season. That's one thing. The other thing, too, it's you know, we talked about the we talk about the pitching all the time when it comes to some of these Korean players, the KBO players coming to the United States, right? And what's the they have to catch up to the major league fastball? That's they right. got to catch up to the speed. Well, the same thing can be said about a lot of these guys playing against some KBO pitching. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of those curveballs last night in particular were coming at like sixty miles an hour. I mean, <laughs> you know, so you saw Xander Bogarts. It looked like he squared up a couple of the balls and he hit him to the track. But when's the last time Xander Bogart saw a pitch coming in at 62? You know, like he's not used to seeing those things. And you see it all the time at different levels where, you know, in that first game, he got a lot of weak contact out of Padres hitters and a lot of pop ups because they're seeing just, it's just slow, 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 slow. And aside from maybe some guys doing some rehab assignments or playing in some winter leagues where the pitching's not as good. They're used to seeing some big arm, high velocity fastballs, high velocity sliders. I mean, you could notice, I mean, you could notice such a difference, obviously, between Dylan Cease and the starting pitcher for the Twins last right. night. But, you know, Machado and Bogarts and Fernando, they're used to wicked spin coming in super hot and not the, you know, the change up curveball mix that has been really hurting the Padre. I mean, even Manny Machado's double down the line, he was out in front of, yeah. way out in front of that pitch. So from that perspective, no, I'm not overly concerned. Again, it's not, it's as much as those guys are getting some reps, it, it's not a game that, you know, I'm glad that they won, but it's not a game that they, you know, were trying to, uh, you know, to overall win. It wasn't game six of the World Series. Uh, so from that perspective, I'm not overly uh, disturbed by it. But I am a, I am, I am a little concerned. I guess the Dodgers are in the same boat, but I am a little concerned because, of these next two games, you're going to see pitching that is just so slow, change up curveball mix that is coming in, you know, below the hitting speed. And then you're going to be facing guys like Yamamoto and Tyler Glasnow, Glasnow that throw some serious <laughs> heat, you know, like I'm Glasnow throws some serious Ched 
and all of a sudden it speeds your bat. It, it's going to have to, you're going to have to speed your bat back up and, and readjust to some high velocity. Now, that being said, Darvish and Musgrove can throw a lot harder than some of the KBO yes. guys too. Uh, but that's going to be an adjustment. I see it all the time, you know, at different levels. I mean, at the college level, when USD plays power five schools that throw gas and then they play a kid that's, it's, you know, throwing in some off speed and, and below hitting speed, it, it jacks them up for an entire game. And it's a, it's a big equalizer and you don't see too many of those Zach Davies pitchers in major league baseball right now. So I, I think there's going to be a little bit of an adjustment in these first two games, but overall not concerned that they, they, uh, they can't hit the double a pitching uh, that you saw out of, out of the KBO. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I feel the same way. It's a it's a unique situation. Traveled halfway across the world. Things are... Which is a major factor as It well. is, it is. Things have been really crazy for this team. I mean, just again, for them to get out of there, hopefully splitting, if not winning, this series against the Dodgers. That is such a boost. But you just, there's not going to be a ton that you can take away from these two regular season games in, in terms of like setting you up for the season because they're kind of like anomalies. Like, yeah, you're going to be disappointed if... Again, they go for 0 for 10 and runner with runners in scoring position, or you're going to be disappointed if they can only scratch out one or two runs. And of course, based on last year, you are have you have every right to go, oh no, are we going down that rabbit hole again? You have every right, but these are weird games in a weird situation that they will not face once they get back to the states and using they can different get their, baseballs too. Different baseballs with different seams, different uh shape. I'm sorry, it's different size, smaller, I believe. Then the uh, baseball in states, the seams are different. Just a lot of like weird things happening, right? Not to mention just the the, the craziness of the trip as a whole. Now again, the Dodgers are going through it too. I want. I, I thought I read right before I walked in because I know there was a lot made of Manny Machado going 0 for four in the in game one. I thought I read that Shohei Otani went 0 for five in game two for the Dodgers. I might be wrong on that. So <laughs> I'm sure y'all let me know if I'm wrong. I can look it up. I, thank you. I mean, the, the only <laughs> difference was like the Dodgers pitching looked a little bit better than the Padres pitching did yeah. in certain spots. I mean, Gavin Stone had faced 11 batters, struck out eight of them. Yeah. And Dave Roberts has now said that Gavin Stone will be the um, fifth starter for the Dodgers going forward. So um, Jackson Merrill, again, John Morosi, you know, coming in with the MLB network updates made kind of a big to-do. I guess you could call it breaking news that Jackson Merrill will be the starting center fielder for the Padres. I don't think anyone is, is super shocked hearing that. I think, yeah. I know I thought That's that like all if they along. were to told us that you Darvish is starting <laughs> game one today. Right. They just haven't, you know, made it official on the lineup card to this point, but that's really what it's going to be. But I thought he held his own. He had good at-bats in that first game, um, hit, a, hit a single in the second game yesterday, I think, in the yeah, in the ninth inning. It's pitching he's used to. It's a double A, right? It's a it, double it A a, comparison league. He's right. been playing double A baseball. I mean, he's he was the one that had seen pitching like that more more times than the uh the big guys. But I I, I like what I see out of the kid. I think he's gonna be a fantastic player. Just hopefully I I, I gotta see his adjustment period once once major league baseball adjusts back to him. Yeah, and a good question in the chat. Are they using the Korean balls or the MLB balls for the real series on Wednesday? I would have to think it's They're MLB. Using the major, come yeah, on. it's MLB. Come on, come on. <laughs> but again, that's another difference. Like you're you're just you're changing, you're in, you're out, your regular season, your spring training, your high velocity, low velocity. Like there's just a lot happening right now. But um, no excuses, of course, for this team. They want to get out to a fast start. It's important for them to be able to set the tone early on in spring training or in these regular season games. And we'll get into all of that. But pitching wise, Braden, um, I thought it looked good. I mean, Dylan sees 30 pitches in two innings in his first game in a Padres uniform. The only hit he allowed was that solo home run. Uh, hit 97 with some fastballs. There were some awkward swings from hitters on him. Um, Johnny Brito, I thought, also a nice outing. Any thoughts from you on the pitching that you saw? And I'm not sure if you got to catch both games. Uh, I didn't like Wu Suck Go too much. Yeah, that's in. I out. didn't really, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily feel comfortable with him in a closing situation. But I think he needs more time. I really, uh, yeah, do. I, I, I think so too. Um, you know, obviously they, they know him more than anybody else, right? I mean, True, it's a great they, point. He played for the Twins, you know, the LG Twins. What's well, so, funny, too, even Hoslan Kim said yesterday that he knew some of these pitchers. Like, he knew what they were going to throw. So I think that kind of helped him a little bit, too. Right. So I think, you know, I think that that's a major factor in in, in baseball and in sports yeah. in general. I mean, when you – these these teams have some serious information on players, 
And when they don't, they look really good. It's like I mean, it's the whole Ryan Weather situation, right? He comes out in 2020 and, and shoves against the Dodgers, and they're like, "What is this? Where's this guy? Who is this guy? We haven't seen this guy before." And then you go, "Okay, well, he does this, and I can attack this, or we can attack that." And then all of a sudden, now we get to see what you're like, and it's those adjustment periods, and and that's the difference between guys that are you know having really good years and guys that that don't have good years. Um, you know, and, and, and from a pitching standpoint, you know, last night, I thought the pitching looked really good. I mean, you know, Cease had one bad pitch. He left in the zone, uh, that was tagged for a home run, but I think he supplied most of the power on that. I liked what I saw to him. You know, I thought Matt Waldron looked pretty good mixing yeah. it up, um, you Matt know, against Hone. the KBO team. Uh, you know, Wus- Wusoko was not, was not the best, but you know, as you mentioned, hopefully get some more time. Um, the thing I, I find interesting with, you know, just Jackson, Maryland in general is he's he's kind of like you know he's projecting he's giving me a lot of like James Altman vibes of the Dodgers. James Altman had like a great start to the year and okay. then like he started to fall apart down the stretch, but he still finished above an OPS plus of a hundred, which is better than an average player. He finished the season with two forty eight average, twenty three homers, you know, sixteen stolen bases. If if Jackson Murrow could put up those numbers, he's going to have a very successful. Uh, first season, I think the Padres are going to have a great, great year. But you know, I, I, if you could get that kind of production out of the young guy, I think you're you're in really good shape. No, I absolutely agree, and I think that you have to kind of go look at Jackson Merrill and you know, realistically look at your expectations and what will be a good year for him is if he can, you know, find himself in the majors. He can develop a little bit of consistency. He's probably going to struggle at times. He can pop out of that. He can adjust to what it's going to be like in the major leagues. You know, there's been quite a few of the big league players, especially Xander Bogarts, and I know we'll get into this a little bit more later in the show too, that have talked about how they're going to need guys like Jackson Merrill, and they are really looking at him now as a piece for this team in terms of being able to help propel them from being a, a team full of superstars into a team that has superstars, but that also is well-rounded enough with other guys to be a team that can go deep into the postseason. It's not just your Angels squad with big name guys, which is what we've been talking about for months now, really. And so you're starting to see players kind of say this or acknowledge this, that they're going to need these younger guys. And for Jackson Merrill, he is jumping into the deep end. He's being thrown into the deep end. He's playing a new position. I don't worry too much about center field, but I do think that there will be a learning curve because I, I just would be surprised if there's not some growing pains there. But really, it's going to be at the plate, and I think he's shown everything he can in terms of spring training, having a good spring. You could still argue, is this really the right time? Should you give him more seasoning? You can argue that till the cows come home, but it doesn't matter. They're, he's in there. He's part of this roster. So it's really going to be on him to kind of take it day by day, take it slow, keep his head on his shoulders, and not get too high, not get too low. I love him in the nine spot, by the way. I do too. That's a perfect place for him to hit because he's a great flip guy. Perfect flip guy. He's young. He's athletic. You know, he's a contact hitter. So he's going to be able to keep the line moving. But also, you know, you got Merrill at number nine. He gets on base. Then you go back with Bogarts or Fernando, whatever you want to do. But you almost treat Bogarts like he's the two hitter. And then you got then you got Fernando on potentially with a couple more batters at the bot after the bottom half of your lineup and you got speed on the bases with Merrill. I I really love him batting in the ninth spot. Plus I think it takes a little bit of pressure on him where he could just focus on himself. Um, so totally I, agree. I really love that spot because some people are like, why isn't he batting like seventh or eight? Bat him nine. No, I love him even nine. if he, even if he hits 400 this year, he turns the lineup over. It's bat great. Nine. I love it. I see this, this uh, comment a lot. He he's got to be better than Grisham and guys, Yes. Like I, I get that. And I think that there's a hundred percent chance, um, a possibility that he, he will be a better hitter than Trent Grisham, or he has the potential to be a better hitter. That's not really the concern here. The more the concern is that I hope a first round draft pick can hit better than 180. <laughs> right. I, I really do. The concern, I think the reason it's been being harped on so much is, is he coming up too early? Will it mess with his confidence? Will it, because yeah, a lot of here, times you see right. these, these hitters and they can't overcome getting like just totally the like concern the, is he comes up, he fails and then he struggles and then he for gets long in his head. Of time and then they send him down and then, they trade and then him. it's a disaster. <laughs> yeah. And then they trade him. And then he's good. And then for he goes else. again is really good with another team somewhere else. Cause right. he gets like the necessary AKA time to 
Ryan Weathers, <laughs> right. who's kicking ass right now for the Marlins. Now he's, by all accounts, Jackson Merrill has been talked about as having a, a great head on his shoulders. He's very, you know, reasoned. He understands there's going to be some adversity. But I, I've heard this said from pretty much Every all, all the guys that have come up. I mean, but he's, they're all different. They're all different. You never know. He'll be the first. He'll be the third player in baseball history to start in center field on opening day under the age of 21. Right. With Ken Griffey Jr. and Andrew Jones, yeah. Hall of Famer and a guy that's on a Hall of Fame ballot. So read. you're putting there's a lot of expectation. Now, in that nine spot, I think you take some of that off. You're able to kind of maybe uh, give him a little bit of a chance to breathe. So I do like that. But there's no doubt there's expectation on him. All right. When we come back, we're going to get into some Aztecs. We're going to talk more about the Padres, more about Dylan Cease, the exhibition games, the culture, what we've seen at these games. Keep it right here. Locked on 97.3 The Fan. We'll see you in just a minute right here on Annie and Elston.
Happy Monday, everyone. Welcome into the Annie and Elston Show. We are in hour number two of the Annie and Elston Show. I'm Annie Heilbrunn. Craig Elston with a much-needed day off, much-deserved. Joined by Brayden Suprenant. We are matching today, Brayden. We didn't plan this, but we're both in purple tops. Frogs! No I surprise did it for the frogs. Brayden is like that because TCU. That's right. But I looked in my closet today and I said, you know, I'm feeling a little purple. Purpley. I just had, always have to specify it's never for St. Augustine. And it's always for TCU. Because <laughs> the Saints guys I know always like, they see they look good in purple. I see you wearing the purple. Yeah. Pur- purple's uh, underrated, though. You don't see a lot of purple. People don't no. just like, pull out the purple. There's not a lot of schools that are purple. That's mm-hmm. why I like the uh, the TCU purple. And it's a royal color. It, that's right. It's the... Uh, Shout out, Kate. Of royalty. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, TCU made the tournament yesterday. For a brief second, I thought we weren't going to make it for some odd reason. Um, so I was stressing through the selection and then we got a nine seed and I was totally fired up about that. So I got to rep the frogs today. Uh, terrible weekend at baseball. So I don't want to talk about that for the frogs, but mm. frog basketball. I like their, uh, I like their, uh, their spot. I like their draw. Some people don't. Yeah. I like it. I think it works for them as they will take on Utah state in the first round and potentially Zach Eady and Purdue. And I think we match up well against those two teams. Well, I love that you're starting with that because we're going to get into all of that with the NCAA tournament, the seeding that occurred yesterday. And of course, for the San Diego State Aztecs, we're going to be with you until 2 p.m., followed by the Gwyn and Chris show until 6 p.m. And then the Matt Scraby show from 6 to 7. So live and local programming here on 97.3 The Fan. And of course, I know I am very happy to be with you all, as is Brayden. So, all right, let's get into it, Brayden, because I know you're probably chomping champing it's champing by the way champing at the bit to get into some basketball and as well you should san diego state university the aztecs lose the conference championship on saturday to the lobos wasn't a big surprise right we've seen that happen with the aztecs before a winnable game i think that they could have won that but they were in familiar fashion down early they made the comeback they got the lead they couldn't close it out didn't score in most of the last I think seven minutes of the game, five minutes of the game. It wasn't great, but they did get the five seed in the NCAA tournament. And that is what matters. They had the five seed last year. They get the five seed again this year. They learned yesterday that they're playing Alabama, Birmingham, the Blazers on Friday, 10 45 AM in Spokane, Washington, East region. Braden. Yeah, that kind of sucks. The East region kind of sucks. Why? Tell me why the East region. Is it because the strength through, of competi- competitors that you're going to face? Right? Well, well, that and they have to go through Boston, which which sucks. I mean, if they make it to the Sweet 16, they're playing UConn in Boston instead of potentially, you know, if they were like a six seed in the West, you know, they'd have to play like, you know, Arizona in LA, which would be a lot better of a draw for San Diego State. So, you know, I, I think overall, I, I mean, a five seed's cool if you're an Aztec fan, but, you know, I almost would rather be a six in the West than a five in the East. I did find it interesting that, you know, they put three schools that were in the final four last year all in the same region, all right next to each other right. with UConn, FAU, and San Diego State. Um, so I, I thought that was kind of odd. You know, Florida Atlantic should not be an eight seed. I don't care what they did last year. I mean, it, obviously, they got the benefit of the doubt because they were in the Final Four last year, but they had two quad four losses. I mean, that is absurd. They should never be an eight seed. Uh, their resume wasn't nearly as good as a lot of other schools behind them. Uh, but for you know UConn, FAU, and San Diego State all to be in the same region after being in the Final Four a year ago, uh, very interesting uh, decision by the committee when specifically talking about the Aztecs. Now, UAB is a very good basketball team. They're very, com- I'm going to say, confident basketball team. Uh, very showy in the American Conference. Uh, they ended up winning the American Conference in their mm-hmm. first year in the American Athletic Conference by winning the tournament uh, to get that 12 seed. Uh, Auburn and Yale, I'm not necessarily concerned for the Aztecs, but you know the thing that's interesting with San Diego State it, this is one of those they they have one of those teams this year that they had in years past where they lost in the Sweet 16, and those are teams that are headlined by a top player, and the supporting cast is good, but it's not necessarily great. Mm. Uh, so it's like Xavier Thames, San Diego State Aztec team that was bounced in the Sweet 16 by Arizona. It is like Kawhi Leonard's basketball team that was bounced by UConn in the Sweet 16 as well. Uh, Aztecs have some depth this season, but not as much depth as they had last year. And the biggest thing is they don't have 
you know, they don't have that go-to big man in the center like they had with Mensa and then followed with Ladie. Now they got Ladie. That's a big man that can also, that's really kind of like plays like a guard. Uh, and that's about it for the Aztecs. And they got to get better support out of their supporting cast. The thing that's interesting with, with the Aztecs to me is they're good enough and talented enough to make a run to the Sweet 16 or Elite Eight. They are also lacking the depth where they could get bounced in the first round. I mean, it's really a crapshoot with this Aztec team. Hopefully they can get hot at the right time and make a little bit of a run. I'd like to see a rematch against UConn in the Sweet 16 uh, just for fun, but I, you know, this UConn team is one of the two teams I think would is is probably going to win this this tournament with them in Houston. I think Houston's going to be really good. But in, as far as the Aztecs draw, you know, the five seed's cool, but I think I'd rather be a six in in a in a in a region that's a little bit closer to home. I, I did find it interesting how they treated the Mountain West Conference, Annie. I mean, the Mountain West Conference we talked about all season was, you know, one of the best conferences in college basketball. They gave them the recognition of getting six teams in the tournament, but they did not give them the recognition of seeding. So mm -hmm. they thought they were good enough to get six teams in, but they did not give anybody relatively good seeds in the NCAA tournament. They gave Utah State an eight. I mean, Utah State won the conference of a six-bid league, and they got an eight seed going against the Big 12 school, and obviously my alma mater, uh, that, that comes from the best conference in college basketball. Yeah, not really any favors for Utah State, and that was even the biggest gripe. I mean, New Mexico wins the tournament. If they didn't win the tournament, you know, they'd probably be out right now. I thought for sure them making the semis was going to get them in, uh, but obviously the committee thought differently about New Mexico. They give them an 11 seed. I think a potential matchup with Baylor in the next round might be pretty good. They do get the benefit of playing in the West. Uh, the biggest the biggest slap in the face is Nevada getting a 10 seed and Boise State having to play in the first four. Uh, Boise State swept San Diego State this year. They've had a, a great season. They finished in the top three of, of the Mountain West Conference. And they have to play a play-in game to get into the tournament, uh, as well as Colorado State. So, good news. The committee thought the Mountain West was good enough to get six teams. The bad news, they really host them on seats. Right. Right. I want to get to that a little bit. I want to talk about the Mountain West in general and, and overall thoughts more about the, the seating. And but in terms of proximity, I'm a little confused because I feel like this was a good thing for them. Like, they're not having to fly across the country they're they're staying you know relatively what two hours and 45 minutes three hour flight it seemed like the players were happy about that oh being in spokane being in spokane they were gonna be in, a, they, they were gonna be Gonzaga. they were gonna be in spokane or or like salt lake city in the city? first round regardless okay okay because I got they were you. good enough to as a five or a six to they were gonna that. be a little bit closer to home in the first round but um you know to to, to be i mean if they're a six in in the um, in the West, they probably could have got Salt Lake or, you know, even, you know, Memphis kind of would have mm -hmm. sucked. But, you know, I, I would rather be, I always like, you know, when you're looking at your teams, if you're good enough and you got a high enough, if you're in a top, you know, top one through six seeds, more time, especially with the lack of West Coast teams, usually that first round, you're going to be playing somewhere close to home. And then it's the Sweet 16 that you really care about because flying from you right. know, San Diego to Boston to take on the best team in the tournament is I mean that's almost an impossible task where you could have been playing, you know, in 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 at at Staples Center or whatever it's called now, Crypto.com Arena. You're playing in Los Angeles, or you know, worst case, you'd be playing in Dallas, which is not that far of a flight either. Um, you know, against a team like Houston or or maybe Tennessee or uh, you know whoever it may have been. Um, you know, if you were in the South region too, like a Marquette, you know, I think you get the edge in that too. But uh, I I prefer to be. You know, in spots where if I make the Sweet 16, I have the host side advantage because I know in the first round, I'm already going to be playing somewhere close. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, I thought Mark Ziegler did a, a nice uh, little breakdown of that, too, in, in the UT where he said proximity may be overrated anyways. Right. Like he pointed out that a year ago, the Aztecs were also a five seed, got sent to Orlando for the opening weekend, then to Louisville for the. Sweet 16 and Elite Eight, and then the championship game in Houston. So, um, you know, probably some of it is is kind of mentally imagining or thinking about maybe something that might be a little bit taxing on yourself. But really, in, in all, 
you know, like these guys are ready for that. I mean, it's exciting enough to be in the NCAA tournament. It's exciting enough to know that you've got a chance. It's survive and advance time. So I think that what I'm going to be interested in with the Aztecs is can they change their formula? Can they, I mean, we've been seeing these, these slow starts, We've been seeing those comebacks. We've been seeing on the road. It has not worked out well for them. Can they, will they ignite something different in the tournament that they haven't been showing this year? Well, they, yeah, well, they're going to need to. I mean, yeah, they, they can't, to. they can't dig themselves in a 12 point <laughs> hole against any team in the NCAA tournament and, and try to climb out of it. This isn't like the Mountain West tournament where, and I, I've seen this, you know, it seems every year where, you know, you know, t- Here's the thing with like just college basketball in general, especially during conference play, officials have so much of a say in the game. Not that they're like picking and choosing, but when you play on the road, I mean, you basically start with 10, 10, you're, you're 10 points down. Right. I mean, that's the saying in, in college basketball and really basketball in general, uh, just because the, the crowd is right on top of the refs and just human nature. I mean, they play into the crowd a little bit and, you know, you saw that statistically with how Ladie was treated when they played on the road. And so you, they, they lost some games on the road, um, that when they get to neutral site games and the Aztec fans take over Thomas and Mac, aka VA House North, uh, you know, they 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 play off of it. And here's the other thing, too, with a lot of teams in the Mountain West, they know San Diego State's the team to beat in the tournament, and they get tight. I mean, they 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 at any point in time know that San Diego State can go on a roll. And I think a lot of teams psych themselves out when they play San Diego State at Thomas and Mac in the month of March, where in the in the NCAA tournament, I mean, you got a bunch of schools that don't care. I mean, they're they're yeah. playing. They've all played, you know, in difficult environments. They've all played in, in neutral sites. I mean, these are all teams that are usually, you know, either really talented and young, or very experienced. So, obviously, starting off, you know, ten points, 12, 14 points down is not an ideal situation. Uh, the fact that they came back against Utah State was great. They were down seventeen, one by sixteen, or whatever it was on Friday night. But yes, yeah. for, for San Diego State in this tournament, you got to jump out strong. Uh, you got to wear teams down. I think they could do that with UAB. I think Auburn's okay uh, in the grand scheme of things. I mean, they come from the the, the team that had second best conference in, in college basketball in the SEC. But I think it's definitely a winnable game. But they got to be able to. They, they got to show up. If they show up flat, it's going to be tough news. The other thing I'll say on location, I think location. It's not as much for the players because they know how to play in different environments. I think it's more for the fan support and hmm. getting kind of that take over the arena sure. attitude. And we've seen that at Viejas when Viejas hosts regionals. I mean, when Arizona's here, you know, Arizona's here, they take over the entire arena for the, for the weekend. And the big schools usually do very well at, at Viejas because they get, it's almost like a home crowd. Yeah. So for San Diego state, you know, that's a, notorious fan base for not necessarily traveling all too far of distances and Aztec fans can be mad at me, but that's, that's the, that's the the word of the industry. People know that. Uh, So them not being able to play in LA in the sweet 16, I think kind of sucks in general before we talk about just overall tournament uh, reactions to to some seedings. Yeah. And I just want to jump back to, the Aztecs and, and being 10 points, you know, behind on a road game and things like that, or essentially starting the game like that in all 10 losses this season, the Aztecs have led or trailed by a point in the second half in all 10 of their losses. They have either led or trailed by a point in the second half. Again, these are kind of self-inflicted wounds that they are making. And so the good part about that is they can turn that around. The unsettling part about that is you need to see them unlock that. Yeah. <laughs> you need to see them do that in a survive and advance environment. But look, Brian Dutcher is going to have his team ready. They're going to be excited for this. Brayden, your thoughts in, in the few minutes we have left here, just on the Mountain West in general and the way that they were seeded into this tournament. Yeah, I mentioned before a little bit. I think Boise State got, got ripped off. You're not going to see any tears out of me uh, <laughs> with Boise State getting ripped off. But uh, they got hosed. In their seating, having to play in the first four. I think the fact that the Mountain West has two teams that have to play in the first four uh, is kind of a joke. It, it's it's one of those situations where like, hey, look, uh, we got you six teams in. Uh, but the one that really jacked everybody up was, I guess, New Mexico was not part of the bracket on Saturday night. And with New Mexico winning, they had to redo their bracket all into the morning. This is what their the, the head chair of the NCAA tournament said. Uh, so that really put a loop through things that really got... Uh, a six uh, team in 
uh, to the tournament for the Mountain West Conference. But overall seeding, I mean, the team that won the conference got an eight seed. AP poll came out today. Utah State's ranked 20th in the country, according to the AP poll. Now, I, I think those guys are a bunch of wind socks, but, you know, they're an eight seed. I mean, they got ranked 30 something in the tournament and they're 20th in the AP poll. Uh, something's wrong here. Right. And I think what really played out with this, I think San Diego State. And now Aztec fans, you know, applaud of, of, of what the program has been. San Diego State as a program is so well respected that despite them finishing fifth in the Mountain West, they got a five seed in the NCAA tournament because of the run that they went on last year, mm -hmm. because of their non-conference play, giving the Aztecs the benefit of the doubt with who they scheduled, how they did in those games. And it really was the, the deciding factor in in that conference because you know a, a conference that was really good but not necessarily i guess as good in the non-con as san diego state i mean san, the 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 mountain west had some pretty good wins outside uh of of mountain west play but you know the aztecs getting the five just shows the respect that the committee has for san diego state now all the other teams i think it goes into the mountain west conference hasn't won a game aside from san diego state in the ncaa tournament and, yeah. and that's that's Basically, what you saw out of out of the Mountain West, uh, you know, just other overall observations, you know, non-conference play played a big role in some of these schools, um, you know, in, in conferences that weren't rated as high. The Big 12 got the benefit of the doubt uh, for being a really good conference. They didn't play anybody in the non-con, but, you know, they got knocked down a couple of notches when it comes to their overall seeds. I'm surprised they got eight in instead of nine. I thought Oklahoma was going to make it, but... You know they didn't really play a, a, that difficult to schedule. The real the real thing that I thought was interesting is the Big East only got three schools in uh, to the NCAA tournament. I think St. John's was way better than Virginia. I think Virginia being in uh, is a joke. I don't know why what the committee saw in them. I thought FAU getting an eight seed was a joke. That is way too high for a team uh, with two quad four losses. Uh, and then there's one other team that got in that was was utterly ridiculous and i'm blanking on it right now but st john's st john's got hosed i think um indiana state should have probably been in the in the ncaa tournament as well i know you're splitting hairs down the stretch but uh it's gonna be a fun oh michigan state yeah michigan state has no business being in the ncaa tournament they just they have the long streak and tom is their coach yada 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 but michigan state at 19 and 14 doesn't deserve to be in the ncaa tournament uh in my opinion but it should be a fun bracket i said it for the last couple of months there's no one real dominant team in the NCAA tournament that you're afraid of that you don't want to draw. And this is going to be the most parody tournament I think we see in a very long time. And last year it was a lot of parody as well. So I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be fun. I know we're going to talk more about it throughout the week. And I know we went a little late, but um, this is going to be a fun, fun bracket. And I, I can't wait for it to tip off on uh, on Thursday. It really is. Good luck with those brackets, everyone, as you're filling them out in your place of work, because they are going to get blown up rather quickly, I think, in some situations. But that's what makes it fun, right? right. So it's going to be great to follow. We absolutely will talk about it more this week. And again, the Aztecs playing on Friday, 1045 a.m. against um, Alabama Birmingham. So UAB. Exactly. The so, Blazers. The Blazers. Annie, yes. The Blazers. I, what is their mascot? It's is it dragon. someone where? Oh, oh. They got a, a dragon. dragon. Yeah, they got a dragon How does as their mascot. Wearing a blazer? No, that's no. the dragon like... should wear a blazer. Maybe <laughs> that's be their. Maybe he does. A I don't know. Dragon. I'd, wow. I'd have to look I can't it. wait to see this. Yeah. yeah the UAB. The UAB. Uh, a dragon. I I love TCU's draw. By the way, they're going to be. They can. I, I'm more concerned about Utah State than Purdue. TCU speed. They're the fastest team in the country in college basketball nice. in transition. Nobody's faster than the Frogs. Fast Frogs, like the fast Aztecs offense and football coming up. Uh, they're going to they're gonna run up and down on Zach Eady if they could get through Utah State. So that's why I like their draw in particular. I would love to see a rematch with Gonzaga in the Sweet 16, but we'll see. Okay, we'll see. I love a fast frog. Right the now. fast frogs. Yeah. They are the fast frogs. <laughs> now, can they shoot when they're not fast? Uh -huh. No, not really. But when they're moving fast, they can score a lot of points. We'll see. We're going to keep talking about this. We will talk more Aztecs, more Padres just around the bend here. Keep it locked in. 97.3 The Fan.
1125 on this Monday here on the Annie and Elston show, 97.3 The Fan. All right, we... We'll not be doing Ask Us Anything right now. We will not be doing Ask Us Anything. Despite the song choice. (laughs) I was thinking, where do I know that song from? Where have I heard this song before? It is Ask Us Anything. It is. There's a couple of the uh, beds I use. They're still bumpers, which can confuse some people. Well, our our, our listenership is ready to adjust. They're elite adjusters, as Mike Schultz says. And one of those just added to the mix. Another elite adjuster is Dylan Cease. Because Dylan Cease was asked, hey, you want to go to Korea? Because this team you, that you just got traded to from the White Sox <laughs> that you already have to wrap your head around, this trade alone is in Korea. And they're flying, as we speak, on a 16-hour flight to play there and be there for a little over a week. Hey, Dylan, what do you think? And you know what Dylan said? He said... I don't want to miss this because I feel like it was like as if he was going to have FOMO. He had a fear of missing out on this because he had a good reason for it. He said this is going to be a team bonding thing. This is going to be something that this team is going to experience together. And I don't want to miss it because I'll feel like I've missed out. I'll feel like I've been left out of it. And so I love that answer from him. He couldn't find his passport. He scrambled to find his passport because he wasn't thinking he'd be flying to Korea this season anyways. Found his passport, got on his flight, packed up all of his belongings at his Phoenix rental condo, had to ship his car to San Diego, met the Padres at their complex to work out while the team was in air uh, en route to Korea. And then he jumped flying to Los Angeles and then to Seoul and met his new teammates. So no biggie right in, right? Like you just, you just, You got to be ready for anything. But what happened was he was told when he got there, look, we we realize that you're here. We're so happy you're here, but we want to be a little bit conservative with you. We don't want you to, you know, we we understand that your body is acclimating. Your mind is acclimating over this trade in general. And now your body's acclimating from this flight and you're meeting, you know, your adrenaline's going, you're meeting all your new teammates. You want to make a good first impression. You're learning a whole new, a whole new country, (laughs) not to mention um, a whole new set of teammates. And so they said, okay, you can pitch in the exhibition game. And actually Dylan Cease said yesterday through 30 pitch. No. Yeah. Was it 30 through 30? There's official pitch count. I want to say that I have that. But yeah, 30 pitches in two innings. He said after the game that he would have gone longer. He would have liked to go longer. But that's an example. The Padres being a little bit conservative with him, which is a good thing because of the, uh, the just all the change that's happened in the last 24 to 48 hours for Dylan Cease. And so they also made the announcement that he will not be on the roster for the two games against the Dodgers, the two regular season games that count. So first of all, that's taken a big amount of stress off of Dylan Cease. I have no doubt he would have loved to get out there and pitch, but it is again saying, relax, relax. You are here. You are with the team. Take a breather. Enjoy some of the food. Enjoy some of the culture. Acclimate. All right. And I think that that was a really smart thing of the Padres to do because they, you know, there's no mystery around it. You're not going to be part of those two games. You're not going to face the Dodgers. But what they did tell him is he'll probably pitch in the exhibition games when the Padres come back to San Diego before they start the regular season home opener against the Giants. So these are two games against the Mariners. I don't believe that they've told him which one yet, but he will pitch in those exhibition games. And so that sets him up to be at the back end of the rotation in that first series against the Giants. I imagine he'll only go an inning or two, maybe three, if he's asking them to go a little longer, stretch his arm out a little bit more. Actually, honestly, maybe three you're looking at in San Diego when he pitches. Exhibition games? Yeah. And then you'd be able to get out, be at the back end of the rotation. I don't know what that means. Is that three, four, five? Um, If he's pitching on Monday or Tuesday, I guess it will matter depending on if he he can get onto an every fifth day schedule, which I'm sure he'll want to be on. But I think this was a good call, Braden. I think this was a good call. As much as I would love to see Dylan Cease face the Dodgers, I think allowing him to adjust, allowing him to acclimate and taking that pressure off was a good thing to do because it is a lot to go through a trade. Uh, yeah, go through a trade and then on top of that, get shipped off to a different country yes. uh, by yourself. Um, go find your passport. I mean, he, he had to potentially go down to Tucson because he couldn't find his passport yes. to try to get a, a passport in the same day. 
I'm sure the Padres try to pull a lot of strings to make that happen as well. I know there are people that do that job. I know one of them. Uh, but that being said, <laughs> there's a lot that goes there's on. There's a lot that's going on. Ship the car. Yeah, he's got to get the car set up. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he's got to deal with living arrangements now in San Diego as, right. opposed, as, a, as opposed to Chicago. Probably has to send somebody back to Chicago to get his stuff uh, for certain things. So uh, it's going to be a, a whirlwind tour for him. And, and they're setting him up for success because, again, they know that you know, he is an investment for the next two years and yeah. they traded some prospect capital to make sure this guy can compete at the highest level. So don't throw him in the fire in the first two games in Korea, you know, give him one of those games, uh, you know, and uh, against the Mariners uh, next week on Monday or Tuesday, right. and then, you know, put him in the, in the backside of the, uh, of the rotation against, against the giants. I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to him pitching on Tuesday against the Mariners, yeah. um, you know, and he misses the Giants series. So that way you don't, not that you're going to play too many games there uh, because you're going to see these guys eventually, but for the Dodgers and the Giants, not have to see, you know, Dylan Cease and then you, you start them off against the Cardinals, uh, I think would be pretty good. So I need to look at like an actual, I'm looking at an actual calendar to try to piece together, you know, how they're going to do this, this rotation thing. Um, you know what? Me too. For some reason, I was thinking five games because I am just not in baseball schedule mode. But yeah, they, they only have to have three games against the Giants. So he's going to probably be in they got the four, next year. They got four? four against San Francisco. Okay. All right. So he so, could be in the last. Right. The, so they're going to go. Yeah. They're going to go Darvish game one against the Dodgers. And then they're mm -hmm. going Musgrove game two. Right. And then Cease is pitching one of the two games. I would imagine they're probably going to go King on Monday. That's true, or too. Are they going to pitch it? I mean, I guess they could pitch him in Korea. He he might come out of the bullpen in Korea. Right, but he's probably not going to pitch too much. And right. then you're off on the 22nd, you're off on the 23rd, you're off on the 24th, and obviously you got to reacclimate to the United States. But you could go King on the 25th and then, um, you know, Cease on the 26th and then restart again with you Darvish on the 28th. You what? could also go Musgrove on the 28th. I mean, there's so many different things you could do to reset that that rotation because of all the days off you're going to have. That's what I was just saying. It's a great point, Brayden. They're going to be, no matter what they do that first series, that first homestand, they'll be able to reset quite a bit throughout that first month when they want to because of those days off. They'll be able to configure that rotation the way they here, want it. Here, here it, let, if he pitches Monday, let's say Dylan Cease pitches Monday against the Mariners. You know, okay. that, that it would be one, two, three, four, five. His... He would be set up to be the fourth guy against the Giants, right? Because then it would be like just theoretically, let's just say it'd be. So like, maybe you go Michael King and then Wal him. Right, Waldron, you. All right, what are we gonna go? Let's let's say yeah. I mean, so it's one, two, three, four. No, actually, he'd be the third day. So what it would be if he yeah, pitches that makes Monday? More sense to me. Yeah. He pitches Monday. I had it right the first time. If he pitches <laughs> Monday, then you go Darvish against the Giants Thursday, Mossgrove against the Giants Friday, or flip flopped. Right, you okay. can do either way if you want. Uh, whoever you want your opening day starter to be, uh, Cease on thir on Saturday is the three starter. Michael King, your starter on Sunday is the fourth starter, and then you go with whoever your fifth starter is going to be. Either Waldron or Brito would be game one against the Cardinals yeah. on Monday, and then you go back into the the swing, and then you got another off day on that Thursday. Exactly, or you exactly. can reset it again. And if you want him to be the two, he could be the two or whatever. They have a favorable schedule in terms of after Korea anyways, in terms of being able to reset things that first month, kind of figure it might not be the way it is the first homestand as it is going forward, but that's going to be a luxury that they have that they haven't had. I, I think they had 30 games or something in a row to start the season last year. I mean, it, they didn't have that luxury. Um, so it's going to be fun to watch. Uh, fun to see Dylan Cease, you know, and his personality come out a little bit. We'll talk a little bit more about him joining this team and also about the camaraderie of the Padres. What a difference. If that is going to be a difference for the team, how big of a difference will that be for the success of the 2024 Padres? We're going to take a deeper look at it when we return right here on Annie and Elston.
1140 on a Monday here in the Odyssey Palace. Annie Heilbrunn here for the Annie and Elston show. Craig Elston out for a day. He'll be back tomorrow, joined by the great Braden Suprenant, who's on the one-twos, as well as the co-host duties right now in a very quiet, otherwise quiet Odyssey Palace. Braden, like usual. Yeah, it's Monday, you know. <laughs> we like it. It's nice easing into the week. That's right. Just want to remind everyone, too, that we will have Bryce Miller from the San Diego Union Tribune on at 1.30 San Diego time, it will be 5.30 a.m. on a Tuesday in Korea, and that's where he'll be calling from, and he's been doing a great job covering the comings and goings of all the players and all the activities and the embracing and reception for ha Sun Kim. He met ha Sun Kim's parents. There's just been a lot of good stuff coming out from Bryce Miller on that trip, as well as from Kevin uh, at the UT, and um, I believe Dennis is in Korea. He's doing a great job, and you know, it's, it's, it's an adjustment, too, for the writers to go uh, over there and kind of get your body clock working the right way and making sure that you're making sense, which sometimes I make sure I have to make sense, and I'm not in Korea. So I have to make sure I'm making sense on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, all right, let's get to some more Padres talk. I thought Kevin, speaking of Kevin AC, he did a really nice job summing up what many of us who are around the team last year experienced by being around this Padres team. And I thought he did a really good job in, in players opening up a little bit about that experience. And I, I want to point out first, and, and Kevin pointed this out in his story as well, sometimes hindsight, as we know, it's it's 2020. You can say things on the other side of something that you couldn't say when you were inside of it or that you didn't want to say. And you can look at things a little bit rosier sometimes or a little bit more focused than you can when you're inside of it. And so sometimes that leads to conclusions or things like that that you know, maybe are a little bit of a stretch because you, you're you trying to put everything into a little box. You're trying to make sense of something. You're trying to go, why was this such a weird befuddling year. Let's make sense of it. Let's package it together so we can put it behind us and we can move forward. And that is human nature, right? Like we all do that in our own lives. But he wrote this story for the UT. I believe it was in yesterday's paper. It was called the all for one approach under Mike Schilt. It was from, this is from the player's words. Okay. The players talked about learning from the embarrassment of last season, talking about how last season was a missed opportunity and how they needed to create a season this year where the mantra is that they are only as good as the weakest link on their team. So this is a philosophy under Mike Schilt, all for one, where he's talking about togetherness. And Mike Schilt is like, look, I don't know that togetherness is going to take us to the World Series, but I know that a failure to have togetherness is going to ensure that we don't make it into the playoffs. We don't make it into the World Series. And the players talked about how last year they felt that there wasn't cohesion on the team. Now, this is something that I know I experienced from being around the team. It was a weird start with the WBC. Then the players were together for the regular season, and it wasn't like they didn't like each other. It was not a clubhouse that didn't like each other, but they just weren't all in on each other. They just weren't like ride or dies. They were not, like I, we talked about earlier, they were not going to jump over the dugout rail or run in from the bullpen when a player might be bullied a little bit out there. They liked their guy next to them in the clubhouse or across from them in the clubhouse. They probably weren't hanging out with them a whole lot. And you know what? You don't always need that. You don't need guys to be best friends on a roster, but you need to kind of have this ride or die mentality. These are my brothers. We're in the trenches together. We're going to get through this together or we're going to fail together. And they didn't have that, right? So Mike Schultz is instilling this philosophy of we're going to pull along because there's going to be struggle throughout a season. Certain guys are going to struggle at different times. It's inevitable. We are going to pull these guys along. We are going to make sure that we are moving forward as a team and that we are not suffering because of the weakest link on the team who is going to be different at any given point during the season, right? But I thought it was really interesting because last year they did do things to correct this. I remember Nick Martinez hosting a barbecue for the team. I remember certain outings. A lot of times a position player or Joe Musgrove, um, obviously he was hurt, so it was a little different, but they, they did certain outings throughout the season to try to build camaraderie. I remember when they held more team meetings 
than they ever have in at least the last recent, you know, three, four years. It was like a team meeting, every homestand to try to address things. So they were certainly trying to build that cohesiveness, build that culture, address the problems in the room, the elephants in the room, but they just could never get on track. You could argue, Brayden, this is kind of a forced cohesiveness, right? Because you've got Korea. This is a team that's been forced to bond, if you will, right now in Korea, or at least forced to be together. I think it's a good thing as much as it's like killing their body clock and all that. Um, at the end of the day, I think that they're going to build some memories that they're going to be able to take with them. That's going to kind of give them some, some, I guess, you know, the, the, the keyword, the hashtag momentum that uh, could be argued is actually a real thing. But I think it's, you know, a lot of what players go through, and you know this, Brayden, it's mental. You have to mentally just believe in things, even if it's like nowhere near the truth. You have to mentally play above your game, even if the stats are showing you otherwise. It's mental a lot. So I'm curious your thoughts on all this, because you have every player kind of saying all the right things right now. That happens every spring training, guys. But I do want to end on, on one more note before I, I toss it over to you, Brayden, which is, this happened with Jace Tingler, and this happened with Bob Melvin, too. Everyone said all the right things. Things worked out for a while, and then they worked out until they didn't. And I think that you have a clubhouse now with enough of the same players to realize this is a pattern that we have to turn around. We as players need to turn this around, or it's not going to improve. And, Braden, you've been coaching a long time. You've been around players a long time at you know different kinds of levels. Is this something that they can hang their hat on this year. Do you think that this is a reality for them, this cohesiveness? It's something that's very important. Um, you know, good good teams are led by coaches. Great teams are led by players. Um, you know, that's 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 how this works uh, in, in reality. And when we had, you know, when we've had teams that have great player leadership, they play a lot better than when we have teams when it's just good coaching leadership. And then if you don't get any leadership from, from either, obviously you're not going to be a very good a football team, and I know football and, and baseball are a little bit different, but it's 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 a major factor is having players be able to hold themselves accountable and having players be able to hold each other accountable and and pulling the rope in the right direction. These are these are very important things for any team in any type of sport. It's why we spend a lot of time, money, effort into doing that at Cathedral because we know how much how important it is for you know especially younger kids to be able to be a cohesive unit and work together and 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 build that relationship where you know and you trust that the person next to you is going to get their job done and you can work on getting your job done yeah um you know i think in football it's a little bit more um important than it is maybe in baseball but that doesn't mean it's not important and i think this is going to be a, a big thing for the padres this year i think it's something that they've lacked and something that the teams that they compete with have. They have that tight-knit group of either players that all played with each other in the minor leagues and have yeah. played with each other all the way up and learned how to be that Atlanta Brave or learned how to be that Los Angeles Dodger. Or you got that group that the Dodgers have where they did bring in some outside guys, but they hold each other accountable where the Dodgers don't have to do that. And that's the that's the sign of very successful teams. Now, can you be successful without that? Yeah, sure you can. Yeah. I mean, if you're very talented, it's not really going to matter, you know, what you have. But those teams that are tight knit are usually teams that are going to over compete and and be able to 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 pick up one another and 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 have selfless at bats. And and those teams are very difficult to beat. And I think the Arizona Diamondbacks are one of those teams from a year ago. You know, mm -hmm. young guys that played with each other, coming up the ranks that you know took care of the little things, grinded out at bats, you know, stole bases and and played some old school hard-nosed baseball, but you know they're out there competing uh and they were competing for each other and that's something that you know I think was very much lacking for the Padres the last couple of years and you know obviously Joe Musgrove has seen that as a problem and has done everything in his power to try to get the pitching staff on the same page. So I I like where this is going. I I think this trip regardless of what the results are on you know on the field i think if this group come can come together in this korea trip i i, I think it's it's gonna it's gonna take them a long way and, and and it gives them an opportunity to overcome some of the knocks that we say on this team you know maybe it helps jackson merrill acclimate to major league baseball uh, a lot better and, and and have that tight relationship with his teammates knowing that they're going to have his back you know if and when he fails 
you know, and, and it's going to play into, you know, maybe not having that fifth starter that the Padres need, or maybe not having that outfielder that they need and, and, and maybe overcoming some of the short, the, the shortfalls that we've seen, you know, with, with things that they can't control in the front office that is uh, right. that are front office problems. Uh, that to me is going to be their biggest recipe for success because we've, we've laid out their roster. We've laid out, you know, all the problems that they potentially have. I do think a lot of it changed with Dylan Cease, but what overcomes that is the way that these guys play, the way they hustle, the way they play for each other, and the way that they gel as a unit. And if they can come out of Korea with this tight knit group and this tight bond and this kind of, you know, the 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 glue of the team, I think they overcome a lot of the problems that a lot of people think they're going to have in 2024. It can carry you. There's no doubt about it. Like you don't necessarily need it. And I've certainly run into players from all sports in the past who say chemistry can be overrated. And I didn't, you know, I went to the World Series or the Super Bowl with my team and we hated or we didn't like, we, we weren't best friends. We weren't hanging out. But when we got on that field, we had each other's backs. We had each other's backs. And the more you learn about the people around you, the more you build kind of that friendship, that camaraderie, the more you kind of like that guy, the more you're like, you know what? I don't want anyone to mess with this guy. This, this is my guy. And it's not going to carry you. It's not going to overcome a deficit in talent. Of course, it's not going to overcome working hard. It's not going to overcome competing out there on the field but it's not something that's going to hurt you it can only help you yeah it's not going to make it worse exactly and it might even carry you and it's i think the diamondbacks is a good a good example it might even carry you sometimes when you should be losing games when you should be farther down in the hole there's a little bit of magic in that there's a little bit of the intangibles that does kind of carry you along in some of that stuff it's 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 a huge thing and that's what gets you out of jams that's what gets you out of you know tough spots that's honestly what gets you out of this you know, the, the whole groundhog day that we had last year where it's like, we know we can do this. We just got to do it yeah. kind of attitude. And then, you know, it, it, it turns into finger pointing and it turns into oh, I'm doing my job and it's just it's just different. I mean, that's there's a lot of teams that can't handle that either. Um, so I I think this is a major step in the right direction. You know, I know they've said all the right things. I It seems like it's a lot better than it was in the last couple of spring trainings. And it I does. think it's a mix of not only the, the I think you're getting good leadership out of the players mm -hmm. which is going to lead leadership. to a great team yes. better leadership and i think you're getting good leadership out of mike shield again i don't want to knock bob melvin because i'm not you and i are not one of those people that think oh good riddance he socks all this other no, stuff I that's do not, not not even close to being the case yeah. from two people that were down in the clubhouse but there was a different sense of you know bob melvin and the way he handles players and I, to be honest with you i mean bob melvin had success running some of the players with with some with some high name guys that knew how to run the A's when they had stars at that time. And then when they didn't have stars, he had to step up. But with this this team and when you have to manage big time personalities and big time talent, which is the very difficult task of a lot of these managers, you kind of have to let them do their thing. And if you don't have those veteran leaders on the team or nobody wants to take ownership of leading the ball club and you don't have that tight knit group, it could lead to a disaster, whereas this year you're starting to get some of those guys. And so Mike Schilt can let his veteran guys run the club, and then he can also hold them accountable himself the way he likes to do it. And I think that's a recipe for success for these guys. Yeah, and I, I agree. And I, I think that some of what happened last year was you had all these superstars, but you 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 didn't have you still had a leadership void. You didn't have a, a full-on set leadership. Um, you didn't know who really was taking the reins on that. And then, of course, you had the injuries with Joe. You had uh, the injuries with you. You had different injuries. And I know Joe is obviously a pitcher, but he does hold weight within the entire locker, uh, the entire clubhouse, and with the position players as well. And I think, too, you learn from the mistakes of your past, hopefully. You know, Mike Schilt can learn from what didn't work last year because, yeah, Bob Melvin is looking at this. Like, you have a room full of superstars, guys that are veteran players, guys that have done a lot, they're going to figure this out because a lot of times they do, but they never did. And I think that even Bob Melvin has said, 
I, I think maybe I should have, you know, dropped the hammer a little sooner. I think maybe I should have done something else a little sooner. But it's it's a little hard, too, when you're kind of put in, in a position um, where there's, you know, there was obviously some issues in the front office. But then there was also some issues with a team that was added a few superstars to the mix, brought back Fernando Tatis Jr., just didn't really quite know how it was all going to gel. But this year they have a better idea. They are embarrassed from last year. And then to your point about the front office, you also have a front office that needs it to work, too. You have right. A.J. Preller, who's on a budget like he's got like a he's got he's got an excel sheet in front of him he's got a strict budget he needs to keep to um he needs to make it work within that and then you've got mike schilt who after this year is kind of a lame duck manager if they keep him around he's going to want an extension so you have a lot of reasoning for this to work going forward and a lot of motivation for absolutely guys to make it work. and it's the step in the right direction it's it's finally that sense of we know how it's supposed to work and they're finally you know, implementing that. Yes. Yeah. All right. When we come back, we will take a look what has been going on in the wild world of local sports. We got it all for you right after the break.
Good afternoon on a Monday. It is 12 noon on the Annie and Elston show here in San Diego. It is a beautiful day. At least it looks that way out of our tiny sliver of a window here in our studio. It looks like the sun is out. We're so happy for you to be joining us. I'm Annie Heilbrenn. Craig Elston has a day off. Braden Suprenant here with me, not only hosting, but also on the one twos. Braden, what is it time for? Oh, time for lunch, eh? Hey, Mom! The meatloaf! We want it now! I see your mom cut the crusts off your bread. Ma, the meatloaf! Well, you probably missed a lot in the sports world. Don't worry. We've got you covered from high school to professional and everything in between on the 12 o'clock Sports Fix on Annie and Elston. Brought to you by Team Kia of El Cajon. You should be driving a Kia from Team Kia of El Cajon. <laughs> All right, let's get this going. All the news and notes from over the weekend here in San Diego. What do you got, Braden? Let's start start us off. Well, we got college basketball and college baseball news throughout San Diego. In the college basketball realm, San Diego State seeded as the number fifth team in the East. They got a five seed going against UAB. That game will be on March 22nd, which will be Friday, at 1045 in the morning. Got a morning time for the Aztecs in Spokane, Washington. That game will be on TNT as they take on UAB. If they win that game, they'll play the the winner of Auburn and Yale, who will tip off at 1.15 Pacific time on Friday on TNT. Mountain West Conference, six teams in the NCAA tournament. San Diego State got a five seed. Utah State with an eight seed. New Mexico got an 11 seed. And then Colorado State and Boise State both had play-in games as 10 seeds. Nevada also got a 10 seed. In the mountain or uh, out of the Mountain West Conference, so six teams in, and hopefully they will get their first W without needing the Aztecs to do it for them, like last year <laughs> and the year before that. <laughs> it seemed to be the tradition of Mountain West basketball. That's the latest in basketball. As for D1 baseball, San Diego State University tough weekend up in Colorado Springs. They lost a doubleheader on Saturday to Air Force ten three and seven five, and then lost yesterday. 13 to 3 to the Air Force Falcons. They're now 1 and 5 in Mountain West Conference play. They will be in Honolulu uh this weekend taking on Hawaii for a four game series Friday, Saturday and two games on Sunday. As for USD, the Toreros went to Ann Arbor and took two out of three and were a couple of pitches away from sweeping the Michigan Wolverines. They won 8-6 on Friday, 16-7 on Saturday, and then lost 3-2 on Sunday as Michigan hit a walk-off homer to uh, win the game 3-2. USD was up 2-1 going to the bottom of the ninth. Couldn't finish the sweep. They'll be in action tomorrow at Cal State Fullerton to to continue their schedule. As for UC San Diego, they played Fullerton over the weekend, and they took two out of three from Mm -hmm. Fullerton to start Big West play. They lost on Friday night 2-1, to one, beat Cal State Fullerton 10-9 on Saturday, and then beat the uh, the Titans 4-2 on Sunday. Tritons will not have a Tuesday this week. They will be at Davis to continue Big West play as they start at 2-1 this year. That's a look at local college and ba- college basketball and baseball scores and notes. Here's Annie with all the professional sports. All right, I'm catching up on a little bit of this because we've been hosting a show for the last two hours, but the A's sign J.D. Davis. So remember him. He stays in the Bay Area now after being released by the Giants on Monday. So it looks like they're signing him for a $2.5 million contract, one year, a number of incentives in that, but I'm sure we will get to more on that later. The Cardinals extended manager Ali Marmol over the weekend. He is no longer a lame duck manager this year. Two-time Cy Young winner Blake Snell has informed the Houston Astros that he's willing to sign a short-term deal to join them, but he is seeking at least a two-year guarantee for $66 million. That includes an opt-out after this season. we got to get to this later, the numbers that have dropped for Blake Snell. Although I am seeing now that the Astros are a long shot to sign him, so um, we'll see if that story's changing. The San Francisco Giants reportedly also remain in the picture for Snell, but they are also waiting for him to lower his demands. And the Yankees have not re-engaged with talks. They are instead 
interested in signing free agent starter Michael Lorenzen. Yankees ace Garrett Cole was informed he'll be out 10 to 12 weeks with a sore elbow. Best case scenario is he could rejoin the starting rotation in early June. Ouch. He's not expected to pick up a baseball for the next three to four weeks and will then be re-examined by doctors. So this will be the first time since 2005 that neither of the defending Cy Young Award winners will be pitching on opening day since Cole is sidelined and Blake Snell is still unsigned. Veteran free agent starter Mike Clevenger, remember him. He has informed teams that he's seeking a two-year deal in excess of $20 million. Good luck with that. Cincinnati Reds to center, for, center fielder TJ Friedel will miss opening day after suffering a fracture in his right wrist. Uh, Friedel was injured in Saturday's Cactus League game against the Seattle Mariners while diving to attempt a catch. And Dodgers manager Dave Roberts said Monday that Shohei Otani, this was Korea Monday, so yesterday, um, he was, as we know, he was ruled out to pitch this year after having a second surgery on his right elbow, but he will soon start a throwing program that might allow him to play in the field this season. Eh. Do we do we does that really matter? I don't know. I yes. Don't so. I don't think so either. All right. In the NFL, and again, I've got to make sure I'm not missing anything here. The Bears have traded quarterback Justin Fields to the Pittsburgh Steelers. The team confirmed that in a statement on Saturday. The Steelers sent a 2025 six round pick Why? to the Bears that converts to a fourth round selection if Fields plays 51% of snaps this season, at least. A source told that to Adam Schefter. So um, Fields completed his third season with Chicago in 2023. He joins a quarterback room with Russell Wilson, who apparently was dining in San Diego with his wife over the weekend, as he should. He lives here. Yeah, he lives here. Okay. <laughs> Los Angeles Rams defensive tackle Aaron Donald, three-time defensive player of the year winner, widely viewed as one of the greatest defensive players in NFL history. He announced his retirement Friday. It says he is certain to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. At least that's what the pundits are saying. Braden, I'm not sure if you agree with that, but he is an eight-time Aaron all- Donald. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's got to be exactly. That guy's a stud. Eight-time All Pro, played his entire career with the Rams, first in St. Louis and then in Los Angeles, which is awesome. Um, was named to the Pro Bowl in each of his ten seasons, and yes, there is no doubt tongue in cheek there about Aaron Donald no. and the career he's had and yeah. his run into the Hall of Fame. All right, Braden, back to you for, is it high school? What are we on now? Yeah, we got some high school right. baseball news. The top 25 came, or not top 25, top 10 came <laughs> out from the writer's poll, which I vote in. These are not my nice. picks, but this is what the uh, consensus was. Uh, LCC, number one team in the county for the second week in a row. They received 14 first place votes. They're three and one after not participating last week. Carlsbad also off last week. They come in at number two. They got seven first place votes. Granite Hills got three first place votes this week. They're now six and one on the season. They come in at number three. Cathedral four, Torrey Pines five, Patrick Henry six, Saints seven, Eastlake eight, Ranch Bernardo nine, and San Marcos ten. San Marcos jumps into the top ten for the first time. Sage Creek, Montgomery, Steel Canyon, Coronado, and Mission Bay all received votes in the top 10 as for games coming up today we got some good baseball throughout the county on a beautiful afternoon in america's finest maranoff nice. the christian goes up to oceanside to take on the pirates saint augustine holds host the santana sultans today at uh at hickman field el cap hosting la jolla granite hills goes down to montgomery east lake in grossmont bonita vista plays host to script ranch San Ysidro will host Mira Mesa. Coronado at West Hills. Mission Bay goes down to modern day. That game will be at 4 o'clock. Cathedral will host Helix. Patrick Henry plays Steel Canyon. Sage Creek at Mount Carmel. Mission Hills at RB. And Christian will be at La Jolla Country Day. And that's a look at latest in high school baseball as we are done with the sports fix um i have a have one more a um uh, it's kind of funny right okay a weird story all right weird okay story. a women's super league clash between chelsea and arsenal on friday was delayed by half an hour after okay. the gunners were forced to change their socks because socks. they both wore the same color socks and both teams cannot be in the same color socks so that is against regulations arsenal as the away team was forced to source black socks from Chelsea's merchandise store and cover the branding with tape. <laughs> All right, so then once the game began, Chelsea, um, yeah, it consolidated spot. It's the league leader, a 3-1 victory over Arsenal, but uh, 
you know, you got to watch out for those things as the equipment manager, as whatever you got, you got to be, I don't know, someone, someone dropped the ball there. Someone wasn't supposed to wear those color socks, Brandon. Uniform problems. Uniform they happen problems. to the best of us. I remember a couple of years ago, uh, we always host the Honor Bowl, which is a great event. Yes. Led by the Honor Group that honors a lot of, um, you know, families that have lost loved ones in in wars uh with yes. the military and they do uh you know they do this a football game it's run by um coach soto mark soto uh whose son was in the military and he he is you know doing this for uh, a lot of families and they they do a lot of cool things and i i love that we get to host it but one year for some reason both teams that played in one of the early games thought they were the road team and they both brought white jerseys oh. and they were both basically wearing the exact same uniforms <laughs> which was super confusing confusing and difficult yes. and they didn't have like you know pennies or anything else and it was like one of the directors we told you to bring your uh solid color yeah. uniforms you were the home team but you know, it's not, I mean, you're playing in a showcase game from a different state. You just assume since you're traveling that you're the road team and not with the, you wouldn't think you're the home team, but it happens to the, uh, <laughs> the best of us. Best I mean, we had a problem on, uh, not really a problem, but a couple of Tuesdays ago when USD played San Diego state, Drake fries left his Jersey at school. Mm. And so they had to send the, uh, one of the directors of ops, Alyssa back to USD in a car <laughs> to go get, <laughs> His jersey because he was pitching that day in some role, fashion, or another. What so, a terrible feeling. I, well, if he, anyone's ever forgotten oh, yeah. something at home, right? And you're like, oh, no, but you got to go get your jersey. So they, they got to school, <laughs> they got to San Diego State, and Drake's like, I don't have my jersey. It's not here. And so Alyssa had to go get it. They ended up getting it. They had a backup plan. He was going to wear somebody else's jersey oh. uh, just in case. And it's the D1 level. Um, so we were talking about that and I mentioned on the broadcast and he didn't realize that we knew about it and his mom called him after and was dying because she was listening to the broadcast and making fun of Drake for, for getting his jersey of course. at school. So I, it happens to the best of it everybody. Happens. Yeah, it happens. It happens. Now, are you uh, big on the Chicago trade and everything that happened? Because, you know, we talked about Keenan Allen going. Um, Jeff Sanders had a story when he was in spring training. Jacob Marcy, who was born in Michigan, um, played college ball at Central Michigan. His allegiances are with the Chicago Bears. Um, you know, he he was really kind of, you know, torn up about this whole Justin Fields thing and whether or not they were going to trade or get the first round pick or whatever. And same with uh, Dylan Head, who also from Chicago had had a lot of weighing in on that. Did you care any one way or another, Braden? Oh, about this. I don't understand it from the, uh, the Bears perspective. I, I just think... When you make moves like that, you're just going to be in the forever purgatory of just drafting a quarterback yes. in the first couple of rounds because you don't have the infrastructure to have one of these good brand new quarterbacks. So obviously they think Caleb Williams is going to be the savior of the franchise. And you know, he he might be, but that doesn't take away from the fact that they don't have an offensive line and they still don't really have any weapons aside from now Keenan Allen. And and if you're Keenan Allen, are you excited for this? Or are you like, man, like, is this guy going to be learning on the ropes here while I'm... Uh, that's exactly what he's going to be right. doing, right? I mean, adjusting the NFL. Uh, they obviously, I, I think the move is for Caleb Williams. I don't think Caleb Williams is going to trans transition to the NFL as, as well as everybody else thinks he is just because of the way, you know, he, he is. He's just kind of a, right. I don't know, he strikes me as kind of a selfish guy. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. But to me, I thought it was an interesting strategy for the Bears, or at least a, a, an interesting decision to make, right? We either trade our first round pick. They had two picks in the top, like 10, I think, mm -hmm. right? We either trade our first pick for more picks mm -hmm. and build around Justin Fields, which is probably what they should have done. Or we trade Justin Fields for I think they got like a four they get a fourth round pick is that what you said? Uh, hold on, hold on, Brady. I just remember <laughs> they got something like super lame out of the deal. <laughs> they right? got they got a the Steelers sent a 2025 six round pick to the Bears that converts to a fourth round selection if Fields plays 51 percent of snaps this season. That's just weird, isn't it? So it's a six, and if he if he starts more games than. Then it converts to a fourth. Then they get a fourth, right? Okay. Well, it, it's basically like you know we we're gonna trade a incentive based, a, right? I'm yeah. not gonna trade you a fourth round pick for a guy's gonna be my backup. Right. I'll trade you a six round pick. Right. And he's gonna be my backup. But if he ends up being a starter and he beats out Russell Wilson, then all of a sudden it's like you know 
it's kind of a way to to save both teams. So anyway, they got a, they get okay. a sixth round, maybe a fourth round pick if Fields becomes a starter in Pittsburgh, which is not guaranteed. I mean, they just signed Russell Wilson, right? Which I think is he's on his last leg uh, in the NFL. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, from the Steelers, I I kind of understand to build some quarterback competition. You bring in two, uh, you know, athletic and and highly talented quarterbacks to to battle it out, and then you know you could probably trade the other one. Uh, if you will, or or whatever you got to do. But for the Bears, I just think, you know, I, it's an interesting move on their part. I don't really understand it. If you want to go with the quarterback thing again, fine, you know, because Justin Fields has been there for a couple of years. And now the knock on Justin Fields, regardless of how bad their O-line is, he statistically holds onto the ball longer than any other quarterback in the National Football League. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he takes a lot of sacks, even, you know, despite having a, a terrible offensive line. But they really got themselves in this problem by drafting Justin Fields before it was time to draft the quarterback. Right. And teams that are successful build from the trenches out and then add the quarterback last so you get five years of a guy in a rookie deal instead of going, we're going to draft this sexy quarterback and get everybody excited and they're going to buy all these season tickets and then he's going to be murdered on the field by the de- the defense of every team that we go against because we have no, no nobody line. protecting him. <laughs> and then people are going to be like, this guy sucks. And then they're going to move on and be like, well, this guy's not the deal. We got to go get somebody else. O- or you finally build the team around him and you get one year before you have to give him a big contract. It's just not a recipe for success. And the Bears didn't have it work out for him this time. So why not try it again? We'll just keep doing the same thing over and over again. I feel like that's kind of the Bears thing. They're just, right. Yeah, I mean, they just run. sort of cycle. Right. Exactly. But so you have either a, a strong, a quarterback that could be very, very good, but is going to be put into a system that is probably not going to be helpful at all to him. And then you're going to have just players also that are just tired of, you know, either him on the floor or drop passes or, you know, and sorry, not drop passes, but miss passes, just a whole, all kinds of things that happen when you don't have a good O-line and you don't aren't yeah. able to get the ball down the field. Look at Bryce Young. Right. He got killed last year in Carolina, which we all thought. Well, I mean, most of us thought watching him play in college, I watched him play live in college. I'm like, this guy's small. Like, yeah. he's he's the best player on the field. Not even a question. Most talented, most athletic, best player on the field when I watched him play Tennessee. He's too small. He, he's just not going to work unless he goes to a place that protects him. That's why Jalen Hurts did so well in Philly. He's got a place that protects him. Bryce, Bryce Young is there on his own getting killed every play. And they were atrocious last year. And that's going to continue for a lot of these teams. So I, I thought it would have been better to, to get more draft picks, go load up your old line, get some young guys, build a young core, go with it with Justin Fields and, mm-hmm. and see what you got. But they, they obviously like Caleb Williams. And I think Caleb Williams is a good quarterback, but I, I really like Drake May in this draft. Um, and I like uh, the kid from LSU. I'm blanking on his name. That won the Heisman last year. He's he's good and and as, as well as... Um, the kid from Washington too, Jaden Daniels. Yeah, Jaden yeah. Daniels, and then uh, the uh, the kid from Washington that transferred from Indiana. I mean, th- those guys okay. are like built for um, for the NFL. I mean, it's just like CJ Stroud. Like CJ Stroud was built for the NFL. He's got the measurables and the arm. Where you know some of these guys are just athletic in college, but they don't their measure their size doesn't translate to the National Football yeah. League. All right, very good. That was our sports fix for the day. Um, Braden, anything to add there that we missed? But I, I think we, we covered it. I think we, we covered we, it. We got it. We got it. All right. When we come back, coming up, actually, we're we're gonna get to what the crystal balls say, what the magic eight balls say about the playoff predictions, the world series predictions, the division predictions, the any the, the any Braden the, forecasting. <laughs> The uh, the seance where we, we close our eyes and we think, who is going to win each division? And let me tell you, you guys know me from, from listening to the show over the last few months. Nothing more that I love than predictions. Projecting. I say that completely sarcastically with the biggest sarcasm font you could ever imagine. But we got to do it. Okay, it's, it's a rite of passage going into the regular season. So we'll get to some of those predictions. More Aztecs talk, more Padres talk on the way. Keep it right here. Annie and Elston, 97.3 The Fan.
<laughs> what is this music? <laughs> what is this song? Aerosmith? Oh, is it? Okay, sweet okay, emotion? okay. It's the beginning part. Oh, this is Sweet Emotion? Yeah. Okay, I got I got to get to the liner now. What it, is it this It threw song? me a little off. I was like, well, are we in like some banjo kind of? Am I in like an underground? Here we go. I'm, it's a great song. Yeah. Oh, is it a great song? It, Do you even know song. if it's a great, great song? song? I did not recognize the intro, but it's a great song. All right. All right. Tune into 97.3 The Fan this Wednesday and Thursday as Soapy Joe's presents the games from Seoul, South Korea. Listen to Jesse Agler and Soapy Joe's Chief Bubble Officer Tony Gwynn Jr. call the action. Soapy Joe's is also the official sponsor of our Padres in Seoul, South Korea watch party this Wednesday morning, 3 a.m., 7 Mile Casino. It's all brought to you by Soapy Joe's Car Wash. Good, clean, fun. You might even hear Aerosmith, Sweet Emotion playing at Seven Mile Casino, when you're there with Ben and Woods and Paul, bright and early Wednesday morning. And Annie. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the midst of hiring someone who's like a doppelganger. Yes. Who's going to go. be there. And be like, Adam, no, I was there. I was, I there. was there. We have pictures. Right. It's just, you know, she, she did a really great job. And like, you can't, you can't really say otherwise that it wasn't Annie. You so. make like a poster of yourself and just have it. <laughs> Like the one we have of Ben over here somewhere. We have the one of ben. It's getting worse because so Adam Klug just wrote in the chat, Scraby and Ello say they're coming. Ah, wow, that's wow, funny. Wow. No, they're not. Okay. There's no way. I think Craig has hinted that he he's like this. Craig has been like this. Oh, I'm going to set my alarm clock, but I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Oh, you know, Craig is making it. Okay. Brayden, are you in? Or are you out? Uh, I got to figure out what I'm doing that day in general. Uh, because it is the uh, it is my 29th birthday that day. So hey, I don't know. that's I'm, right. Right. So I do have I have football practice at 6 a.m. So that's uh, that kind of puts a fold in driving down to Seven Mile Casino and then driving back up to Cathedral. Uh, plus the the thing we talked about this on the show before. Um, just like it's not watching the game at three in the morning down at seven mile mm -hmm. casino it is us having to do a show four hours <laughs> after that game is over yes that really puts a wrinkle in it plus on top of that you know am i gonna get dinner with my family or hang out with my friends i mean like but i don't want to nap the whole day during my birthday i mean i can like pull an all-nighter i guess and just be up for more than 24 hours that's not very healthy though um so that's a, that's a tough one when it's your birthday yeah i don't know that you're adding extra hours onto the work day usually you're you know you're, you're chopping a few hours off you're doing something and even though it's going to be a blast and i encourage everybody it's to get be down great. to yeah, Mount Casino for that 3 a.m be safe of course because it's going to be dark and early and things like that um but brayden i don't think anybody would hold it against you completely understandable that you might want to spend your time uh, some other ways, but, but, but there should be a good contingent of 97, three staffers um, down there. And there should be good contingent of fans. Now I, I personally think that there's a lot of fans right now that are like, oh, I'm going to be there. Don't worry. I'm going to be there. And when that alarm goes off at two 30 AM, they're going to hit snooze and then be like, Oh man, Oh man, I was going to come, you know, like that whole excuse later, I was going to make it, but it's you know, right. oh man, my alarm, my, my alarm didn't go off. My wife didn't wake me up. Um, no, but I, I think it, they'll get a great turnout. They always do. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. And hopefully the Padres win. And hopefully the Padres win. That's, because that's the other thing. I keep forgetting they, that they're they drop not a exhibition game, games. If they drop that game like 14 to 2, that's going to be a tough, <laughs> tough, tough morning. <laughs> Brock Jensen says, will the watch party be live streamed? Listen, if they can figure out how to do that, Brock, which I'm sure that they'll, they'll at least they'll be putting it on like their video clips, like um, Adam or whoever's down there. I no doubt about it. will be sending some video out through the interwebs one way or another. So uh, as far as their actual 6 to 10 a.m., well, gosh, they're not on their actual Ben and Woods show. I'm sure they'll have their their little cameras on their laptops Correct. and they'll be live streaming. That's the answer to your question, Brock. Yeah. And I just went really far. The best way to the do it, to get to the it. best way to do it is not like go to bed and then wake up. It's just like take a nap tomorrow, go to sleep early tomorrow and then go through your day. Yeah. And then at the end of Tuesday night, going into Wednesday morning, go down to Seven Mile Casino you know, play some games and then go into 
the Padres game. And I told Craig that's what he needs to do if he wants to I do that. I agree with that. And then just crash. Well, the hard part is you got to wake up at Thursday at 3 a.m. There won't be a watch party, but if you're going to watch that game, right. but but you just you just keep the party going from Tuesday into Wednesday. You don't let yourself fall asleep. Correct. He's going to like fall into his keyboard while he's sitting here for the show, but as That'll John as John Rostin would say, we sleep in May. <laughs> yeah. We sleep in May. Uh all this uh Scraby Sinatra coming to seven mile like a boss. Scraby will arrive with a lady in each arm wearing a We're tux. A tux. I, I'm seeing I these hope comments so. in the chat. I hope so. Scraby's got a lot of expectations on him. That's I, right. I look forward to this. I don't you see know? Scraby in a tux down at the casino. I do too. Now I'm gonna be disappointed if I see Scraby in not a tux. That's right. Sammy's gonna parachute in also wearing a tux i could see actually sammy parachuting in we're also doing, wearing a tux we're doing yeah. an ocean's 11 heist of seven mile casino exactly apparently. exactly he'll be like um like Ma james bondy he'll be like not james bond but ocean's 11 -y. who's who's the guy in that george clooney thank you george clooney is the main character like sun sammy will have his sunglasses on i prefer rust i prefer the i prefer brad pitt in that movie but oh well brad who can go who can go wrong in that movie I guys mean, eating a snack was, in every scene yeah Phenomenal. It's also, great, just great so flick. you know, a laid back, uh, laid back heist man right there. It's <laughs> awesome. Some great, so great one liners in those movies. I need to watch so that. So many. Movie uh, again. That's they're all great. All three of them are great. Sammy uh, Bond. The yes. second, the second movie when they're in Europe for some reason that was <laughs> the uh, subway or the train station scene is hilarious. Where they all think George Clooney is like fifty years old and he's just so upset about it. <laughs> Do I look fifty to you? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 you don't. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> so good. <laughs> it's Jimmy G619 says, I'm about to see everyone from 97.3 SD, their weight loss journey live. You're going to see them in real life, Jimmy, and see if the weight is actually off. As opposed to seeing us on these cameras every day? <laughs> yes, I don't know. You can see the full body. This is getting creepy. But either way, it's, uh, it's going to be a fun time. Um, I think they were talking on the morning show about making sure that you know or hopefully having some heaters out there the game will be on um i i didn't watch the exhibition game full disclosure i did not wake up at 3 a.m to watch the exhibition game i caught it later that would be almost psychotic right but for the regular season regardless of being at seven mile or not um definitely looking forward to watching that regular season game and honestly it's it's kind of tripping me out a little bit that it is a regular season game i keep thinking of it like it's an exhibition game but it's team, not. Yeah, it team counts. is two days. I mean, they're playing a regular season game on Wednesday. Uh, 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 that starting lineup is going to come out. It's going to be a lot of fun to see. If you're not first, you're last. And when you leave Korea, you're either going to be in first place or last place. It's awesome. It's or both, be... I guess, if you tie. <laughs> oh, yeah. The overreaction from Korea is oh, going to be off the charts. But would we expect anything less? We've already seen that no, with the first couple not. of games with the uh, 0 for 8 <laughs> with runners in scoring position. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be good. And speaking of predictions, um, we're gonna pull out our crystal ball. We're gonna pull out our magic eight ball. We're gonna do a little seance here. We're gonna get into it of our predictions, Braden and myself's predictions for this upcoming baseball season. Keep it right here. Annie and Alston will be right back on here. Ninety-seven three, the fan.
Listen to Sam Levitt's podcast, Inside San Diego Baseball. Sam will cover everything going on with the Padres. Find it at 97.3thefansd.com, the Odyssey app, or wherever you get your podcasts. Had to find that liner there, but I did find it. Welcome back. It is 1240 on this fine Monday in America's finest city. Annie Heilbrunn here of the Annie and Elston Show. Craig Elston has a day off. Braden Suprenant here on the one twos and also co-hosting a man of multitasking talent. So thank you, Braden. You're welcome. <laughs> and we're having yeah. a lot of fun today. A lot of Padres talk, Aztecs talk. We'll be getting into more of that as the show goes on as well as we head into hour four. I had to look at that clock and make sure that my math was right. Girl math. And we're also going to hear from Bryce Miller. I want to keep reminding everyone about that 1.30 p.m. He will be calling in from Korea, where it will be 5.30 a.m. Korea time. And so we're really happy that he's going to be joining us and giving us some insight into what's been happening in Korea. But first, Brayden, my favorite thing, and I mean this with the biggest sarcasm font you could possibly muster, <laughs> we will be doing division predictions plus playoff predictions, plus World Series predictions for Major League Baseball for 2024. I cringe as I say it, but it's a necessary evil. Let's see if we can learn something. Braden, take it away. All right, since we got opening day coming up on Wednesday, I want to jump out in front of this and not yes, panic with it. Yes, I want to be behind it. it. Yeah, no. that's right. So maybe we'll do these, and then after the first two games, we might be able to switch it depending on what we see. It's a rite of passage. It really is. That's right. You have to do it in sports mm -hmm. talk radio. That's right. Even the writers, I mean, like you know, sports Everybody journalism does, does it, it everywhere, all across the, the mediums. All right. We're, uh, we'll break down division by division, American League, National League. We'll start with the American League because we don't care about that league as much as our beloved National League. Starting out here on the West Coast as we got – Houston, Texas, Seattle, the Angels, and the dreaded, god-awful Oakland Athletics, who are still in Oakland, by the yes. way, surprisingly enough. Um, we'll go through your predictions first because you got, you have the over-under win totals for each team, and then I'll give you mine. Uh, but you got Houston winning the division, correct? I have Houston winning the division. Do you want me to give the... They, they win more than 93 games, yes or no? Yes. All right. Texas, number two on your list. More than 88 and a half games? No. We'll finish less than that. Yeah. Who's your number three? I got Seattle at three. They, they, they're they at 87 and a half games. I don't have them winning more than that. So you have them at 87? Taking sure. the under? Taking the I'm under. Taking the under. Angels. <laughs> taking Angels, 72 and a half games. They are my number four. I do not have them winning more than 72 and a half games. Under. Ooh, under. I guess I am picking under on that. Okay. Oakland, 50, 57 and a half games. What if your team was only predicted to win 57 and a half games? That is what's happening in Oakland. I do not. I'm taking the under. Taking the under. I'm taking the under. You think you're going to be worse than that? No, you know what? I, I, am, I, am I allowed to change it? Yeah, I'm going to give them the 60. I'm going I'm to take the over. I'm going to take the over All on right, that. Over on okay. So yeah. Annie's got Houston, Texas, Seattle, LA, and Oakland as her five in the division. Uh, mine's pretty similar, if not the exact same. I got the Astros going 91 and 66 rows. I have them winning 91 games and winning the West. I got Texas winning 89 games. So the over uh, for them, under for Houston. I got Seattle winning 88 over for them. I got the Angels winning 70. I'll take the under. And I got Oakland winning 59 games and losing, uh, what is that, 100 and something. Uh, I have them uh, over as well because over 57 and a half is not that difficult of a task. Right. We have the same. Uh, <laughs> I have the Astros winning the division. Texas and Seattle are wild card teams for me. You only have Texas as a wild card Correct. team. Correct. Astros winning the division, Texas as a wild card team. Central division, we're a little bit different, but not too much different. Minnesota, number one for both of us. Uh, I got them at 84 wins. Winner, uh, over under 87 and a half wins. under 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 for the twins mm -hmm. we both have cleveland coming in second i have them under 78 and a half wins you over under under but just by a few i got them at 75 wins okay. i have kansas city coming in third i think they're uh the kansas city padres are going to be a lot better uh than the detroit tigers who uh kansas city made some moves a lot of small moves throughout um uh, the offseason i got them at 73 wins though yeah. i'm uh, shaving so still a little the bit. still the under in that you have Detroit as number three. Do you have them winning more than 
79 and a half game. I do not. All right, so under there too. So we flip flopped Detroit and Kansas City. I got Detroit winning 72, so a game behind KC. Uh, we both think the White Sox aren't going to be very good. I have them winning 69 games, so I'll take the over on 63 and a half. I take the over on 63 and a half too. I give them a few, I, I at least give them like five more games than that. But White Sox are going to be bad. Yeah. Uh, Minnesota is my division winner. They are your division winner. Mm-hmm. Nobody else we think is making the playoffs from the Central Division Correct. in the American League. Yep, exactly. On to the AL East, where we're all over the place here. You got Baltimore coming in first, followed by New York, Tampa, Toronto, and Boston. I have mm. Toronto coming in first by three games over Baltimore, followed by Tampa Bay, New York, and then Boston. Uh, 89 and a half wins, yes or no, plus or minus for the Baltimore Orioles. I- I'm going to give them an over, a few games, over. I'm taking the under as they're coming in second place. Mm-hmm. So I have them winning 87, though, and making the playoffs. Uh, New York over under 93 and a half. Wins. Under, under. I'm taking the under, under as well. I got New York winning 85 <laughs> games. I think they could have a, a very abysmal season in New York. Well, and especially, I mean, Garrett Cole now. I mean, that's, you know, that's a tough, that, that's blow. A tough blow. You already know that Judge is going to get hurt at some point. He's already kind of hurt. Stanton's only a matter of it's time. It's already in. They got Having older players. Yeah. MRIs and things like that. Okay. So you got New York coming in second. I have them coming in third. Uh, Toronto, I have winning the division at 90 wins. So I'll take the over on the 87 and a half. You got them coming in fourth, over under 87. Uh, yeah, I have under 87. And then the Red Sox, I have coming in last place. I think they go 80 and 82. The AL East is usually one of the best divisions every year. They do win a lot of ball games. Um, I got them at 80 wins, which means I have them beating the over by a half game over under 79 i'm gonna go with that too i give them that give me 80 at least 80 and 82 yeah all right so we're both but i have my wild card teams in that division or playoff teams i've got baltimore winning the division and then new york and tampa as wild card teams i got toronto winning the division i think baltimore makes the playoffs i don't think tampa or new york make it they Mm -hmm. just miss out behind texas and seattle uh overall in the american league uh, I have the Astros with the one seed, Toronto with the two. You don't have to have this. Minnesota gets the three. I'm just going off of my the records I had, uh, which means Texas gets the four, Seattle the five, and Baltimore gets the six seed, um, which means Texas plays Minnesota. Houston has a bye. Baltimore plays Seattle, and Toronto has a bye. Uh, I'm going to take Houston – and Baltimore in the ALCS, and I'm gonna get I'm gonna take Houston to go to the World Series. Are we ready to, to World Series? I'm gonna take the Orioles to go to the World Series, and my AL wild card teams again. So I've got Astros, Twins, Orioles, and then Yankees, Rays, Rangers. Correct. Yeah, but I'm going to go with the Orioles. You got the Orioles coming out of the American World Series. Yeah. As for the National League, this is where it's more fun. We'll save the West for last. Out East, uh, we both have the Atlanta Braves coming in first, followed by Philly, followed by Miami, followed by New York, followed by Washington. Mm -hmm. Exact same. Uh, We'll go through the over under totals. Atlanta over under 101 and a half games. Under. It's asking a lot, man. That is asking a lot. I'm going under as well. I have them at 96. Philadelphia over under 90. 89 and a half. Sorry. I had them over low 90s. So do I. I got them at 95 mm-hmm. and a game behind Atlanta in the East standings. Miami, 77 and a half games over under. I'm going to say under. I got them over at 79. Okay. I think they win 79 games. New York, 80 and a half wins over under. Uh, over. Under, under, sure. Under, under, the, under. Mets. the Mets do Met things. <laughs> I'm taking the under for the Mets. Yeah, the Mets always seem to Met. That's I mean, the thing. 80 and a half wins. Who's their pitching staff? Yeah. I mean, who do they have on their team? Who's left? They have they have a lot of holes. A lot team. of holes. Yeah. And they even said, well, according to Max Scherzer, they're not even trying to win until 2026. They might be it's deadline. They might be deadline sellers. Pete Alonzo available. Mr. Uh, Met. Mr. Met available. available. They're keeping Mrs. Met though. <laughs> Mr. Met will see us. See Diaz is for. back, but you got to get to Diaz. You can't. I mean, right. You, you have a closer, but if you're if you're not ahead, then you're not closing. Whole uh, I got the Mets at 75 wins, so I'll take the under on that. Washington 66 and a half. I feel bad saying the under. I will take the over. 
but I, not by a lot. I took the under because <laughs> I think they win 66 games. Okay. Okay. But I think that's pretty on par with when they. I'm gonna Vegas give them did. like 68. Uh, we both have Atlanta and Philly making the playoffs. Atlanta winning the division for both yes. of us. In the Central, a little bit different standings, at least at the top. I got the Cardinals winning the division with 86 wins. You have the Cubs winning the division. So you think they're going to be over the 83-and-a-half win total? I'll go over. Yep. And the Cubs. I have the Cubs. Correct. I have St. Louis. I just I, think I just I'm, I'm uncertain about St. Louis, but they always do seem to find their way into the playoffs. They always mm-hmm. do seem to. I mean, not last mm-hmm. year, but for the most part, throughout their history, they tend to have a winning organization. They don't have many down years, right? And last year was a down year for right. the Cards. Uh, Cubs, I have going 82 and 80, so I'll take the under on the Cubs 83 and a half. I have the Cardinals winning 86 games, so I'll take the over on 85 and a half. Mm-hmm. Are you gonna you're gonna take the under? I would imagine if on St. Louis, seconds. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cincinnati, 80 and a half wins. We both have them in third place. I have under at 79 wins. I'm going to stay right at that 80. So what is that? Is that taking the, you would be taking the under. Okay, great. Under, uh, Milwaukee. We both have, or actually I have them in coming last, uh, 77 and a half wins for Milwaukee over under. Mm-hmm. Over. I'll give them 78. All right, over from Milwaukee. I'm taking the under. I have them winning 70 games. Pittsburgh, I think, is going to be a little bit better, but not much. I have them over at 76 wins. Their projected total is 75 and a half. I'm going to I'm going to go like 73 on Pittsburgh. So under on the yeah. Pirates, on the Buccos. Yeah. But they have all these new bobbleheads now. Oh, they did they get? Did they, the, yeah, yeah, that's right. The, isn't there like an FBI investigation on it's that now? Possible. <laughs> the bobbleheads that were. That were stolen by the Pittsburgh Pirates. Right. <laughs> Allegedly. Uh, Allegedly. I don't think Milwaukee's going to be very good. They lost Devin Williams. They lost their manager. They didn't do anything during yeah. the offseason. I just think, too, I wonder how much of a difference Craig, Co- Craig Council is going to make for Chicago. Right? right. But for Milwaukee, for Pittsburgh, yeah, I don't. You know, the Brewers, that's a thing, too. I mean, the Brewers always tend to hang around. The Brewers kind of just are there in that wild card race. But I don't know. They, they did. They lost a few aces. They lost their manager. They they lost a lot in this offseason. Uh, I got the Cardinals making, making the playoffs as the lone central team making the playoffs as the division winner. You got the Cubs. Let's go to the West. L.A., I got them over 103 and a half wins. I have them winning 106. You have them in first place, over under 100. I have them in That's first place. I am not giving the Dodgers more than 103 wins. I no. wouldn't either, but Under. that's what it came out when I went through my program. <laughs> okay. I was a little disheartened by that. But that's <laughs> finishing 22 games in front of the Padres. Uh, Arizona, number two for both of us. 83 and a half wins for the uh, the Diamondbacks. Yeah, and I'm giving that to Arizona. Honestly, it could flip-flop be- between Arizona and the Padres, but I'm giving it to Arizona because they were in the World Series last year. and so I'm Over 83 them- or under 83? Over. I have them over as well at 88. Mm-hmm. Uh, Padres, we both have in third place. Over under is 81 and a half, which means if they go over, they have a winning record. If they don't, they'll finish 500 or worse. I have them at 84 wins. I give them over then, yeah. How many over. wins would you give them? Mm-hmm. I'm going to go 85. Braden. You could change it before opening day and say, uh, before the <laughs> before our, our uh, broadcast we're going to do on opening day that we haven't announced yeah. yet, you can you can change your pick. I would like to ho- reserve my pick. I would All like right. to reserve well, my number. I'm at 84. We'll see how the first two games go okay. for the Padres in Korea. Uh, I got the Giants coming in fourth. So do you. I got them at 84 and 78. Tied at the Padres. Padres get the nod over the tiebreaker. Uh, Giants over under 82 and a half wins this year. I'm going to go under. Give them like 80. I can see that. Mm-hmm. I'm taking the over, obviously, because I'm at 84. Colorado. I got them going 64 and 98. I think they play well for Bud Black, even though winning 64 games is not very good. And finishing 42 games out of first place, also not very good. But that's higher than the 59 and a half that they're projected to win. I'm going to go over 59 and a half because, again, I feel really sad for those fans if they win less than 59 games. So I'm giving them over. Give them like 66. I got the Dodgers winning the division. Arizona and San Diego making the playoffs. You have the same thing. I have the same thing. I have San Diego in the playoffs as a wild card team. I got Atlanta winning the National League because the Dodgers always choke. And I got them playing the Astros in the World Series. Okay. I have the Phillies just because ah, I, I think I like that it. maybe it's, you know, you know, we're going to get killed for not picking the Padres on this, I feel like. But I, I just think the Phillies have been right there, right there, right, right. there. And I think they'll be right there again. And I put them over the Orioles because the Orioles really aren't changing a whole lot from last year. And they're 
had a lot of those young players that probably are making a jump to that second right. season. So I think that the Orioles are going to be a team that contends this season. I'll take the Bra- I'll take the uh, Braves over the Astros in the World Series. I take okay the you Braves got, over the Astros. Okay, you got Phillies and Orioles. Orioles, but you can't ever count out the Braves either. Can't no. ever count out the Braves. They also choke in the playoffs a lot. And look, yes, we don't want to jinx the Padres, and also it is it is it is wide open for the taking. Whoever gets in the World Series. As we saw with the Rangers and the Diamondbacks yeah, last year. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Our predictions mean crap, guys. Well, baseball is the hardest thing to predict. But it who is do you the got? hardest thing. What do you got? Yeah. Phillies or Orioles? <laughs> Phillies or Orioles? Oh, I have Phillies. Right, Phillies over the Orioles. Yeah. That'll do it for our predictions. See, that wasn't too bad, Andy. That wasn't too bad. You go rapid fire, go through, yeah. get some get some ball knowledge out there. That's right. It makes it forces you to think about some other divisions and things think like that. Think about other so teams, other rosters. Yeah. And a high, high pace deal. All right. When we come back, last hour of the show, hour number four, more on Annie and Elston when we return. 97.3 The Fan.
Hour number four here on the Annie and Elston Show, 97.3 The Fan. I'm Annie Heilbrand. Craig Elston with a much-needed day off today. He will join us again tomorrow. Joined in studio by Braden Soprenant today on the one-twos as the producer and also hosting along with me. And we've had an action-packed show. We've talked a lot of Padres, a lot of Aztecs. We're going to get into a little bit more of the Aztecs right now. But on the football side, which is something I've wanted to get into a little bit since um, meeting Sean Lewis last week. But as a reminder, we will take you until 2 p.m. And then Gwyn and Chris will take you until 6 p.m. Followed by the Scraby Show, 6 to 7 p.m. We will see if he will be in a tux for the Scraby Show. Time will tell. Tux for the Scraby Show. <laughs> but I, wouldn't that be great if he showed up on his video one day and he just, just all dapper? It's like, where are you going, Scraby? What's up, Slick? What are you doing? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what's happening after this? You know, <laughs> um, a lot to talk save, about. Gotta go save the world. <laughs> we are exactly. We see him on the local news later that night. Ben Higgins has a report on him. <laughs> Super <laughs> Scraby. Saving a burning baby from a building That's and a right. kitten. 100%. Um, a lot to get to here as we roll on this week. We will have a lot of Padres talk. The two regular season games coming up on Wednesday and Thursday, riding right along into a jam-packed weekend. The memorial and, and celebration of life for Peter Seidler on Saturday at Petco Park. Fan Fest on Sunday. A few exhibition games, a day off, and then we are right into the thick of the regular season. So y'all better get, you gotta start getting ready. Like you gotta make your target run. You gotta start getting ready to be down at Petco all the time. Get your warm blanket, whatever it is that you need, your clear bags. Like there's stuff you gotta do to get ready. At least in my mind, there is. Mentally prepare <laughs> for mentally, beer fest. Yes. To mentally prepare. Is All the right. The cooler going to be there. See, that's right. not, See, that's the big problem now. Is you know, the go-to spot the cooler is at you know Gallagher Square. And are they going to have it back? I mean, it's under construction. This that's might another be a, thing, though. A Gallagher huge Square. Wrinkle that's not going to be done until maybe a couple of games in. I think Gallagher Square is. Uh, it already it's going to have to be habitable. Like fans are going to have to be able to get into it, right? I mean, tickets are sold, I would imagine, for that area. Like, uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know. We're going to find out. <laughs> can you buy, I don't think you can buy season tickets for that area, so okay. you don't have to worry about that. And But all the all the pictures and images we've seen from people who live around there and, and are shooting into the ballpark oh, looks they're cranking, amazing. They're I mean, cranking that thing out quick yeah, right now. Yeah, and uh, construction goes either one of two ways. Sometimes I see construction, and I'm like, how in the world will that be done? But then it's like they're wham, bam, bam to the end. You know, that it's like team no sleep or it's obviously construction can take a lot longer. But let's let's think positively for these Padres and Gallagher Square because it does look cool. And I think it's going to um, it's going to be one of those things that you're going to have to see and then remember where everything used to be. Right. You're like, oh, wait, that was like where the playground was. And that was where like your cooler was. And this was where the beach was. And it's, it should, should be pretty cool to see. And, and people are going to have to go see their bricks. That's right. That's right, the bricks. All right, well, we got a brick over at the uh, Western Metal Building, which go. is super cool. There but uh, I know they had to move the bricks and redo. I think they're redoing all the bricks that were over there before or something. Well, if you walk through also the Western Metal Building, you will happen upon the Breitbart Hall of Fame where are, there are all the plaques for all the athletes who have been inducted into the Breitbart Hall of Fame. And the organization that handles that is the San Diego Sports Association. They held a luncheon last Wednesday, and I emceed that luncheon, where Sean Lewis from San Diego State was the guest speaker. And it was my first time meeting Sean Lewis, head football coach for the Aztecs. Very tall man, very friendly, just a warm demeanor, someone that you you want to be hanging around. You want to have a beer with Sean Lewis, and I don't even drink beer, but you, you want to crack open a beer and kick back with Sean Lewis and his team and talk a little football. And he he talked to our our uh, sports association group. He talked to the people that were at the luncheon a little bit about his mission, his identity with the program. You at least I got the sense, Braden, and I'm sure you maybe from listening to him as well. He kind of talks like he wants his offense to run, very fast paced, very passionately. Like he doesn't slow down. He doesn't skip a beat. It's like. Be aggressive. All right, move down the field. Yeah, he's go, 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 just like his offense is going to be for sure, 100%. He's, yeah, so so a really good presence to him, really uh, funny as well, like a good sense of humor. And he was talking about how he's been on the circuit for San Diego State in terms of just getting introduced to the San Diego community. And that's something that comes along with coaching. It's it's amazing. And you'll know this, Braden, from being a, a head coach even for at the, at the collegiate level. Um 
a lot of your time is spent not on the field. Like you are out in the community or you're doing a lot of stuff in the office or you're in a lot of meetings. But a lot of times like you, a lot of the, when you get on the field, it's like, that's like your salvation. Like that's your respite away from everything else. Cause you don't have to deal with now meetings and dotting your I's and crossing your T's and paperwork. And, you know, it's the same thing with a manager. I always talk to managers their first or second year after getting into managing. And they're like, you would not believe how much like paperwork there is, like how much like work there is to do that's inside the office and not necessarily out on the field. And like, you just have to get used to that, right? Like that's just kind of something that comes along with the, with the gig. But so we were talking a little bit about that and he was talking a little bit about NIL. And I know that we've talked about this on the show. And Sean Lewis was saying, because he was asked about NIL and how do you navigate this landscape? And we heard Nick Saban talk about this last week where he was talking about his wife and he was talking to, I think it was like Congress or something. Yeah. It was part of that panel that uh, Ted Cruz put together. He had some coaches in there. You had the Cavender twins, you know, it's the kind of a yeah group of all individuals that either are, that are affected by NIL, whether it be player coaches, administrators, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, he, and so he's, he's talking about how his wife came up to him at, at a point, Nick Saban's wife and said, why are we doing this? All that these players care about is NIL money. They only care about this money and how much they're going to make. All right. Now, I personally, I don't like, I, I respect Nick Saban. I mean, I, the guy is like a legend. He's an icon. I don't like when people use alls or nevers. Like, I feel like you can't generalize. You, know, you can't I like mean, generalize the entire college landscape, but you got what he was saying. All right. So, of course, Sean Lewis was asked about it. Um, and he was talking about how he, had two families that were on campus. And of course, SDSU is different from where Nick Saban from Alabama, right? Yeah, just a little different. <laughs> just a little different in programming. So, and 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 Sean Lewis acknowledged that and the respect that he has for Nick Saban. But he was talking about how he had two families recently and one family, 95% of them, 95% uh, of what they were asking questions about was the San Diego State campus, San Diego State Athletics, how their son would be utilized into Coach Sean Lewis's program. The program itself, the identity of the program. And there was about 5% on NIL. And he said he had another family where 95% was NIL and 5% was questions about academics and program and how my kid was going to fit in there. And he said, look, it's pretty simple. I call back the first family. I don't call back the second family. And you kind of start to weed them out. And I'm curious your thoughts on that, Braden, because of course it's different from college to college and conference to conference. And San Diego State also is not going to be necessarily getting the kind of kid all the time, right? That's going to be able to make big bang bucks on NIL monies, you know, such as you can in maybe in Alabama or something like that. But you're still going to have kids wanting to get their share or wanting to get kind of their cut of some of this, right? And it's still the wild, wild west. And that's what he was acknowledging is like, he thinks that there will be regulations about around it at some point or some kind of revenue sharing or something like that. But as you and I have talked about, it's the wild, wild west. I mean, there's no rules around it at all. So what are your thoughts on that, on kind of like the way that you, you roll with um, families and recruiting and everything like that when you're, when you're talking about NIL? Well, first of all, I love his answer. Yeah, for sure. The answer is the best because that, that tells me that San Diego State's in good hands and you're bringing in kids to fit your program because at the end of the day, as talented as some kids are, they have to fit your program in order for you to be successful for a couple of reasons. One, they will stay, uh, which is a major thing nowadays. And two, it goes back to the camaraderie thing that we talked about with the Padres. They fit the narrative. They will listen to the coach. Um, you know, They will go about things the right way. They're in it for the right reasons. And I think that is a major uh, playing point and 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 Sean Lewis is right when it comes to I mean there's going to be kids that are just they're going to go to the highest bid but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be set up the best for success and if you're San Diego State it's not like you can really pick and choose too much just because of the school that you are but you do want to find kids that want to be San Diego State Aztecs you got to find kids that want to be part of the program that believe in the program that want to be you know, that fit the mold of the team that you want to create. And, you know, for Sean Lewis, obviously, you can think about it from an X's and O's perspective. He wants to be a fast team that gets on the ball and, and, and runs plays every 10 seconds. You need the personnel to do that. You yes. can't just have everybody do that. Uh, there are players that are really good at that, and there's players that don't fit that 
uh, style of play. Mm -hmm. And those are the type of players you look for. But on top of that, you're recruiting and recruiting, you're recruiting the families just as much as you're recruiting the kid. I mean, because these families are going to be part of your organization as well. That's something that, you know, being around USD, I know with their baseball program, they value that. So when they're looking at a kid, I mean, they're, they are evaluating the parents. Do these parents fit mm-hmm. our program or are they more in it for something else? Do they fit like their son fits? And if, you know, if a player, if, if a parent is too much of a pain in the ass, mm-hmm. you know what, you could be somebody else's problem. We don't need to deal with that. And, you know, maybe I take a little bit less talent in a player, but he fits my program. His parents fit my program and it's going to lead to, you know, kind of a happier group than just taking the the best players that that want the most money. And I think that's a good answer out of Sean Lewis. Now, there's always going to be a kid that might be a little bit of a tweener where he kind of fits and he Mm. might just need a little extra money. That's where you use NIL to your advantage and not be the guys like, well, we're totally against it. You can't be totally against it. You have to embrace what the new landscape of college athletics is and use it to your advantage while trying to get some of the kids that fit your program. And I think San Diego State basketball's done a good job doing that. And I think San Diego State football is going to be lined up for success in this particular category as well, just based on the answer that Sean Lewis gave you uh, or gave the committee right there um, about how he's going to focus on the NIL. I mean, they're looking for the right players that fit the system that want to be set up for success because here's the other thing too. I mean, you know, players could ask for as much money as possible and that's good. But if you don't see the full picture as a student athlete and all the resources that are available to you, you could blow through your four years and not invest in yourself for the long term, regardless of how good you are at a, at at a sport. Great answer. Great stuff there. And yeah, absolutely. Sean Lewis is a hundred percent embracing NIL as a coach and understanding that that is going to be part of the deal for these kids, but it can't be the entire deal. It can't be that you're taking kids that are just hyper-focused on that are families because guess what, Braden? They're going to go in the transfer portal and go find something better year after year, right? If they're not getting what they they want. Exactly. They're just going to be, there's always going to be a higher price for something. Yeah. Where where those kids are going to leave anyway. Why cater all this time and effort into a player that, you know, is probably going to leave at the end of the day, uh, you know, after one season because he can get a bigger check and it could be just like a little bit more money. I mean, obviously Alabama is dealing with that problem, but a lot of those big schools, can handle that problem right now because they could just let four hundred thousand dollars walk out the door. Yeah, with, with it doesn't no hurt them that asked, bad, right? It, but it's going to come to a point mm-hmm. where a lot of boosters aren't going to be paying this this kind of money anymore because they're going to be like, "Why am I giving this eighteen year old five million dollars for him to leave at the end of the time and then go get six million dollars somewhere else?" I mean, eventually there are going to be some boosters that say we're not paying this anymore. That's going to be the thing. I think if their hearts get broken, like it's one thing if you, and believe me, I, I fully support NIL and, and the, 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 the intent behind the original part of it, which was the not pay name, to play. The right. Image and right. the likeness of, I can't, you know, the, the dumb rule of, I can't buy this kid lunch because it's an incentive so stupid. to go to my school right. instead of like, this kid's really good at football. Here's $6 million to come play football and tell the rest of being a student athlete to go to hell. I mean, that's basically what it's, what it's a lot of these big schools are doing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and making, making money off of your branding, setting yourself up for some, some stuff in the future, or even just during your time in college, making some money for yourself. I get that. And I think it's great. Um, the problem is that there's no regulation around it. And so you do have a lot of just open, who knows how it's going to turn out, you know, it could go one way, it could go another way. But I think if boosters get their hearts broken, where you're investing in someone and you think that this guy's really going to help your program or this, this girl or whatever, and then they just kind of, you know, use, they hop around to just kind of get more money. Um, I think that's when you will get some, some resistance to like, wait, what are we doing well, here? And, and I think this is all going to come to a head eventually when you, when, when some of these players, I mean, when they officially become, employees like they want to there's it, it, you know it's not just going to be all fun and, and and it's going to be all benefits of being a college athlete and a pro athlete with none of the negatives i mean there there are negative sides of being a pro athlete right you sign contracts you're stuck with that team even if you play a lot better you yeah. don't get more money from a different you don't get to have a one year deal every single year you know if you're a pro you could be traded like Dylan Cease, Mm -hmm. right? And Mm -hmm. in college, they can't trade you. I mean, there's so many different things that are the benefits of the college athlete. And right now, 
uh, you know, college athletes have all the benefits of being a pro on top of all the benefits of being a student athlete with really no negative signs to any of it. And to think that just because they're going to be, they do pay taxes already. So, you know, I know people are not, you know, saying that, but they do pay taxes. They, they have classes. I've seen it like the, all right, guys, when you get this amount of money, you got to file this to the, the, uh, the IRS, they have paperwork they have to do. So yeah. right now these guys are, are paying taxes, uh, on this, these gigantic money figures. But that being said, if you think overnight college athletes are going to form a union that's better than Major League Baseball, who has done it for years upon years, where they're going to get all these benefits and guaranteed money and all this stuff. Are you going to tell me that these colleges are not going to fight back with, all right, well, if we give you this, you got to, you got to, you got to compromise with that. That's where it's going to be very interesting for college athletics is when they do officially become, you know, because they want to be pros. What are some of the caveats going to be? Are you going to, when you're out of high school, are you going to sign a four-year deal? Or do you have to go into a draft to be an SEC player and then you get drafted by a team? Could you get traded? Could you get cut, picked up on waivers? I mean, there's a lot of, obviously I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but the thing I do find really interesting to, to kind of translate it back to Sean Lewis and the Aztecs. Every answer he's given is phenomenal. But right now with San Diego State, and the crossroads of college athletics with the with with conference expansion and everything and mm-hmm. and and other conferences going to die and the small guys getting left behind you really need a presence in football after to match the basketball these next 2 years with the college football playoff and group of 5 champion getting in this these are very important years for the Aztecs football program and they have the best leader possible in charge right now for Santa Cruz State too I I'm going to be honest with you it's really saved this athletic department uh, when when things are about to get really interesting here in the next couple of years. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's obviously, you know, it's all talk until you get on the field and you start to show it. But I walked away from that thinking that they're in really good hands and that he's a really good fit with what this school needs, with what that program needs. And in a time that, like you said, is 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 and he acknowledged it too, the conference realignments and everything. Like, who knows how that's going to turn out? Who knows what's going to be the fallout from all of that? Who knows where San Diego State is going to be left um, once that is all said and done and figured out and everything, right, Braden? I mean, it's still going to be like a lot of question marks around all that. Right. I mean, I, Adam Paul says like, well, the big lawyers of the big unions are going to get involved. It doesn't matter. I mean, it takes years to have the union that is as successful as Major League Baseball. Plus the leverage the colleges have they have the leverage where at the end of the day, I, I hate to break it to people. Most people watch college sports because they went to the school They're or alumni. they have some tie to the school, not because the player playing, they yeah. could give a damn who represents their school. They're rooting for the Jersey and the brand. And the biggest counter to that all the time that we say is why is the G league so low attended and nobody cares? Of the NBA? Yeah. Why does nobody care about the G League? Probably because you don't have any attachment you have no ties. to the players. You have, right? Nobody cares. Right. I, it's the, not your hometown right? player. It's, it's not, not your, it's, yeah. It's, you don't care. You don't have any ties to the G League teams. It's just, well, they're in our town. Well, that's mm-hmm. kind of cool. All their teams are better than the than the college teams. Mm-hmm. All better. They'd wipe the floor at the best. The worst G League team would destroy UConn in basketball. Mm-hmm. But there's no attachment. Right, it's the same thing with with minor league baseball. I mean, there's a lot of people would rather watch college baseball because it's their school over some minor league teams, and that's the leverage that I think the colleges are going to use back to these unions, and why there's going to be this kind of middle ground. That's where I think college athletics is going to get real interesting. It's a good conversation. It's not going to be the end of this conversation by any means because things are going to twist and turn. Not going to be a resolution for a while in either category, but we'll keep talking about it. Want to get to a break here. A reminder that at 1.30 p.m., we've got Bryce Miller. He did just text me back from Korea that uh, he's on the same time timing that I'm on in terms of making sure that this interview works on air because <laughs> we had to do a lot of calculations. You know, are, is it Monday for me? It's Tuesday for him, 5.30, oh 1.30. So we had to go back and forth a little bit, trying to make sure we were on the same page of when the timing on this was going to be. But I feel good about it right now. So we're going to make sure we get to that at 1.30 p.m. and hear all about what his experiences have been in Korea and what he's seen from the players. We'll take a short break. More with Padres and Aztecs when we return right here on 97.3 The Fan.
126 p.m. on Monday, a blustery Monday. I was lying earlier when I said it looked beautiful here in San Diego, nice and sunny. Brayden, is it raining behind you? I need, I need you to look. I need Brayden to it's give not, me the weather not, report. It's okay, not, it's not raining. It's just some clouds are rolling like in. Rain. <laughs> Sounds like we're going to get some thunderstorms later this week, I guess. Thank you for joining us here. Hour number four. We're about to get to Bryce Miller at 1.30 p.m. from the San Diego Union Tribune. He will be calling us live from Korea. So very excited about that. And before we get to that, Braden, I want to set the scene a little bit. Everyone who's been watching these exhibition games, no doubt about it, even if you haven't, if you've been scrolling social media, you've been seeing some of the interesting quirks that have been going on with these KBO games, right? So a bullpen below, I saw Tom Cosgrove talk a little bit about how weird that was because the bullpen is below ground. And so you don't acclimate to like the, the sights and the sounds of the stadium until you're called up to pitch. And then all of a sudden it's like sensory overload and you're like, what is going on here? It's been apparently really, really loud at these KBO games, which is something that we've heard um, coming into these games in Korea, that the fans there are really electric, really engaged in the games. And then I don't know if you've noticed, Brayden, the cheerleaders. Yeah, Have on the you top noticed of the, dugout? the cheerleaders? Yes. And the yeah, the guy that's like banging on the drum and then the, the girls on there and then the mat. I saw the friar was participating <laughs> in some of the, the cheerleading. So it's it's pretty fun. I mean, it's just very very up tempo the entire time. It is. It's very up tempo. It's got its own like unique twist, unique spin on things. Um, the cheerleaders on top of the dugouts, they're dancing. I guess there's like a cheerleader competition between the two sides or something like that. Oh, wow. It's very That's bring cool. it on. <laughs> right. It's 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 cool. And then they've got like that huge drum, um, some interesting food choices in the stadium, which we'll get into with Bryce as well. But got to be a cool experience as a player, because even if you've seen that on TV, like if you're inside of it and like you're, you're just like again, kind of sort of being overwhelmed a little bit by all of these new things that you maybe haven't seen in, in a stadium or perhaps I guess if you played in the in the WBC, you've seen a little bit of a flavor all around as you've played in those stadiums. But still, I, th I think it'd be pretty cool to catch as a fan or a player. I think it'd be pretty cool. Yeah. It's like Adam Paul pulls in, uh, you know, the movie Mr. Baseball. You ever <laughs> seen Mr. Baseball? Tom <laughs> Selleck goes out to, uh, he plays in Japan and stuff. He's like one of those players that, um, you know, it's kind of, He's kind of washed up in major leagues and it's yeah. his last ditch effort to to make it back. And he's like against playing in, I think it's Japan. Um, and then he ends up, you know, falling in love with playing in Japan and stuff like that. But yeah. that's, it's a lot like that. And and it's kind of funny. It's, you know, Tom Selleck as a big major league baseball player, um, adjusting to what baseball's like over in Asia. Yeah. And uh it's kind of it kind of get you kind of get those vibes while watching these games in Korea. But it's it's really cool. It's I you like I like to see that when these international games happen, you get to enjoy how different cultures enjoy the same sport that you like. That's the that's the last point I was gonna make is it's cool to see all that fanfare and all the differences and all the the the, the crowds and the fans and just the way that they do things. But then at the end of the day when the game starts it's like oh it's baseball. And no matter where you are, it's like, oh, it's baseball. And that's kind of cool, too, where it's just like the centering thing where there's so many differences, but at the, at the same time, they're they're so similar in so many ways. So I think it's 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 pretty cool. And I think that even some of the players that um, were hesitant to maybe go, I think are probably finding some appreciation in all of this. So we're going to get to break here. We're going to go to break so that we can get Bryce Miller on the line calling live from Korea. He'll give us his take on all of this as well. Keep it right here on Annie and Elston, 97.3 The Fan. Go.
Final hour of the Annie and Elston show here on 97.3. The fan will be taking you until 2 p.m., followed by Gwyn and Chris until 6, and then the Scraby show from 6 to 7. And I'm so pleased right now to be joined by longtime columnist for, columnist for the San Diego Union Tribune, does a great job covering all sports for the paper, not just the Padres, but we're going to be mainly talking to him about the Padres here as he is in Korea. He is talking to us from the future since it's Tuesday morning at 5.30 a.m. for Bryce Miller. So, so happy to be joined by columnist Bryce Miller right now, doing a fantastic job covering the team in Korea. Bryce, first of all, how are you feeling? How is the flight? How is, like, adjusting to Korea time? I mean, give us the goods on how it's been going for you. Well, um, if you want to take advantage of me being in the future, if you want any lottery numbers or you want to understand <laughs> what's going to happen over the next 16 hours, that's the time difference. Yeah, it's 530 in the morning here on a Tuesday in Korea. But um, yeah, that's the topic of conversation. Everybody, everybody you run into here, you know, connected with the Padres. I was in a hallway outside the clubhouse yesterday talking to Trevor Hoffman and that was the first thing. How was your flight? Where did you go? How long did it take? And <clears throat> it's just one of those things that the, you know, Xander Bogarts talked about at one of the initial press conferences that one of the biggest things is just getting your body clock adjusted. And mm -hmm. it's hard enough for everybody. So I'm not really sure how people play high level baseball <laughs> in the middle of it, trying to sort all that out. But uh, so far the Padres have, and they've played pretty clean baseball for the most part and uh, won a couple of games, uh, exhibition games here in uh, South Korea. And, and the Dodgers are, you know, for us a day away and for you a couple of days away, but uh, you know, it's been good. I, I flew through Seattle. It, it went pretty smoothly. And um, really the best part of it is, you know, the challenge of you get on the ground and, and the language barrier is, it's a little more real here than in, in some international trips. And uh, so you kind of, it's fun to kind of try to navigate and learn a little bit of the language. And, you know, um, last night, Dave Marcus off the Padres broadcast and Dennis Lynn from the athletic, a former union tribune reporter, we went to a Korean barbecue and it was incredible. And, you know, just a lot of times you're pointing at pictures on menus, and you're, you know, you're limping your way through, but, all things considered, it's been great. Well, you've done a terrific job banging out some columns for the UT, talking about some of the ways that Hassan Kim has been celebrated since coming back to Korea. And I'll, I want to get to that in a second, right. but let's start with just the atmosphere. I mean, you were just talking about the food. You talked in one of your columns about potato ice cream at the ballpark, spicy pork feet <laughs> right. dumplings, Korean blood sausage sundaes. And then Brayden and I were just talking about the cheerleaders, the drums, like... We can see it on TV, obviously, but it's got to be different being in there. Can you kind of take us through what it's like in, in the stadiums? Yeah, it's a different environment. Um, just the energy, the, the singing and the cheerleaders and the drums that you're talking about, uh, they're in specific sections, uh, almost equidistant down the first base and third base lines, and they kind of alternate. And then all the sections around them kind of join in, and they seem to know all the chants and the songs. And it doesn't quit. I mean, it goes through the last out of the ninth inning. It's just the energy level never, never slows down. I mean, we all know what it's like to be at a major league baseball game where there are moments where a game drags a little bit and, and people are sitting there and it gets quiet in a park and uh, it just never gets quiet in, in, uh, in the stadium uh, for these games. Um, and, and there's, you know, there's, Subtle things too. I was talking to Tom Cosgrove, the Padres relief pitcher. There aren't bullpens out, you know, where we would traditionally see them, where fans can see relievers warming up. It's inside, and uh, <clears throat> he really didn't like it. He didn't like going from a completely quiet environment and then coming out to all that noise, especially the, the extra noise that you experience at uh, at a game here in South Korea. It's just kind of a jar. He called it sensory overload. It was kind of jarring to go from one extreme to the other. Uh, but again, talking to Trevor Hoffman in the hallway about that, he he said he liked that. He liked to he liked to get focused, and uh, he he felt differently about it. But you know, there's things like that. It's it's the the environment that you feel and that you notice and that is in front of everybody. 
Um, but there are subtle differences too. And, and like you said, the concession stand is, I mean, it's a, it's an adventure. Um, I have not been brave enough to try the blood sausage, uh, <laughs> Sundays, but, <laughs> but, uh, somebody told me, uh, it's okay. Um, so we'll see if I see if I summon up a little bit of courage. We're starting with Bryce Miller, the San Diego Union Tribune is joining us live in Korea, 540 in the morning on a Tuesday morning compared to 140 here on the Pacific coast mm. of the United States. Uh, I do want to ask a little bit about just like the fandom of, you know, South Koreans and, you know, with Major League Baseball in town, obviously they have their own uh, fan bases for their own teams in the KBO. What has been the reception like from Korea for both the Dodgers and the Padres coming in? Has there been you know, a lot of Padres fans in comparison to Dodger, uh, Dodger fans from the, from the locals because of Hassan Kim is the, uh, you know, Shohei Otani, uh, Yamamoto, a big factor. I know they're Japanese from, you know, across the way over there in the Pacific, um, you know, ocean, but you know, what, what's been the local reception of having major league baseball in South Korea? Well, so, I mean, we'll know more Wednesday, but, uh, it, you know, it's it's a little bit hard to gauge, uh, you know, one part of that question, uh, you know, the fans for the Dodgers versus the Padres, because at, at local time, those games are, uh, the last two days have been at noon and then at seven. So they're pretty spread out. So the fan bases have, you know, they arrive earlier and they clear out and the next group comes in a few hours later. I mean, obviously I've <clears throat> seen some Dodgers fans. We've seen Padres fans. Uh, I got to be honest at the, um, the game where I wrote about the environment and everything, I walked around the stadium for two or three innings and, you know, found some of those items at concession stands and watched the cheerleaders and the drum sections. And um, there were Padres fans, but it, it wasn't overwhelming because you're also talking about a lot of pride, <clears throat> I think, locally for their baseball. Um, you know, the Padres opened with the Korean national, you know, Team Korea, the national team. Uh, so they were very excited whenever they would get a hit, you know, when, you know, if they would, you know, make a defensive play or whatever. Um, and then you've got the two KBO teams, uh, you know, the Dodger, Dodgers played the heroes and the, uh, Padres yesterday played the LG twins, uh, one of the, one of the very best teams in the KBO. And so there's, there's a, you know, really big mix of those fans and jerseys and then, I just had to laugh just randomly. I ran into some guy wearing a Brewer's hat, which I didn't quite <laughs> understand. You don't even see a Brewer's hat in, the, in California or the U.S. outside of Milwaukee, I don't think. But but uh, I did there. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, obviously, I'm very interested in what the reception is specifically to like Shohei Otani, um, especially when that game comes on Wednesday. Um you know, I, I have firsthand experience knowing the kind of reception ha Sung Kim had in the last exhibition game. He hit a couple of home runs. Uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting, too. It's it's not uh, – how do I explain this? So if you're a Petco or something, somebody hits a home run, <clears throat> you know, it, it's just loud cheering. It's just kind of an eruption of applause. Here it's like this <clears> – um, Everybody's like, ooh, ah, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's loud, but it's, it's a different kind of reaction to it. Like impressive. And even in the press box. Right. Yeah. Even mm -hmm. in the press box, some of the Korean media do it. It's not quite cheering in the press box. It's just an appreciation for what they're seeing, but expressed differently. And so that's pretty cool. And it's interesting. Yeah, that's really cool. And then, you know, we've heard different songs for the different players. Right. And But just getting to Ha Sung mm -hmm. Kim again, like you, you wrote a column about him being at a baseball clinic, a youth baseball clinic. It was put on a few days ago. You talked to his dad. You got uh, great quotes from him. I love the quote at the end where his dad joked, my name is Soon Young Kim, but now it's changed to Ha Sung Kim's dad because of the popularity that right. his son has had, right? What have you seen about that, about his return to Korea and just the way that the community has or hasn't embraced him, I guess, in, in, in his return? Yeah, that was a that was a really funny and interesting and cool moment when they had a youth clinic. It's on a, I guess it's still kind of active, uh, U.S. military outpost in Seoul, it was the headquarters for the U.S. military operation, you know, back to the Korean War. And 
<clears throat> it's been pared down and that land is slowly being given back to the Korea, but they, they had a, a youth clinic there and it was, you know, local kids, but it was also children of uh, military personnel and they had all the players and they put them into little, you know, they did drills and little groups and they would rotate. And then at the very end, <clears throat> you know, the focus really, you know, really turned to, and uh, Chan Ho Park, the first Korean to ever play in the major leagues 30 years ago this year. Uh, I mean, he's an absolute rock star in South Korea, well, in Korea in general, but in South Korea, uh, you know, in, in particular, uh, he's, he's one of the most known people, especially in a sports sense in this country. And they lined up around home plate and they had a, a batting tee and they started hitting baseballs off it. And, and Manny Machado went first and he kind of hit more tea than baseball. I mean, even these guys, when you, when you put up a little plastic tea like kids use, um, it's a little bit different for them. They're not facing velocity and reacting in the ways they can drive the ball. So he kind of chunked one into the short outfield and all these Korean kids just booed him relentlessly and he was <laughs> laughing. And he, he, he hit a couple more and he couldn't quite get one to hit one out and he had one to the track but it, he hit it pretty far and it, it stopped short and he still just booed him and he looked around like what i almost hit that out i think fernando was the only one to hit one out but all these people tried it even the south korean uh, president tried it but hoslin kim who just minutes earlier met, met the south korean president and you know bowing is a sign of, of respect obviously <clears throat> here and in, in across much of asia but uh, he was bowing so many times. It was just like, you know, you could tell uh, what meeting the president, he, you know, the reverence for meeting the, the leader of the country. So all that pressure and Hassan Kim gets up there to hit in the first swing, the bat just comes flying out of his hand about it. Just it's just I think I described it, it kind of helicoptered, but it helicoptered right over the president's head. <laughs> and it. And it it wasn't like right it was high so it was quite a bit higher than him and it went into the netting but we jokingly called it the assassination attempt here <laughs> i guess that breaks the ice <laughs> you know <laughs> but it, but it's funny and then his dad had a great nickname for him in the interview when i asked him what he, his nickname was as a kid uh he told leo bay one of the interpreters for the padres and leo's laughing hard and then the dad's laughing hard and i go i can't wait to hear this and his nickname was cockroach because he was small and he ran around so fast and so in a hallway outside of a press conference i got him and and just asked him about the bat and the uh and the nickname and and as far as the bat he was it's funny he said i yeah, the bat was slippery, and I didn't want to interrupt him and go, well, it wasn't slippery for Manny or Fernando or even the president when he swung, but I guess it was for you. Um, but he said, I was just hoping nobody got hurt, including the president. So it was a, it was a pretty funny moment, but you got a little slice of what it was like to see him return. I love it. It's it's. You know, you mentioned expectations, and I think that that is something that is as much as we talk about how fun this is or how this must be so full circle for Hassan Kim and, and how he must be appreciating this. Um, you're right. There are a lot of expectations on him also in his return. But I did want to just touch on the other players on the team because it's no secret, Bryce. There were some that were looking forward to this trip less than others. Just the just the fact of in the middle of their spring training flying halfway across the world, acclimating, you know, still being able to bring their skill set and their talents onto the field and, and produce in what's going to be regular season games, games that count. But it seems like from the pictures and the video that maybe even some of those ones that weren't necessarily looking forward to it, maybe they might be bending a little bit. I'm curious if you've seen that, if you've kind of seen some, maybe just a, an appreciation for being there and what they're witnessing there as a team. Yeah, I'm not, I don't know that I have a great gauge on who's, you know, really embracing it more than others. But, you know, in a press conference, they had uh, Bogarts and Manny Machado and Tatis and, and a Korean journalist asked them about what they're trying to do or see. And, and uh, they're really curious what, what these Major League Baseball players are interested in while they're here. And <clears throat> Fernando, like he did in Mexico City when the Padres played there, he's, he's clearly ventured out, um, you know, to like, 
different places and, you know, just walked out publicly and, and done some, some cool stuff. I remember talking to somebody with Padres, I guess one day, Manny went to this mall that's connected to their hotel. And, and there's a couple of those where there's a nice hotel and then there's these huge multi-level malls. And I guess they're, you know, these malls are packed and he's just walking around and nobody bothered him. And it, I, I don't know if that's a mix of the one thing, uh, uh, people in Korea are very respectful. Um, it's, uh, and I'm not sure the best way to explain that, but, but it's, you can tell some of these guys wanted to, wanted to experience and see a few things. They just didn't want to be trapped in their hotel rooms and at the, you know, in the stadium. And, um, so it's, you know, it's a broader, they get it too. They're like us. Uh, if you're in a situation like this, there's a little bit of tourists going on there. You want to see and experience a couple of things. You don't want to live life in a bubble, uh, during the short time that you're here. And it's, it's fun that, uh, it's fun to hear about the stories where, where they kind of found things that they're explorers too, you know, and they're playing a little baseball along the way. It's been really fun to see that and to see from your vantage point, as well as the columnist for the union tribune to see a different side of Hassan Kim. I mean, we had a comment in the chat right now here um, that people are watching through YouTube that they usually see Hassan Kim as, as very reserved, right? I mean, he's now in his home country. Yeah. He gets to have a little bit of fun um, with his family and maybe see a different side of him, right? That you've been able to capture. So that's been really cool as well. Bryce, do you have any plans yeah. for your off day today? Are you, uh, you venturing out? Is Way it to off- know the schedule. <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it actually is. I only know that because um, I feel so terrible that on your off day, you woke up at 5.30 a.m. to get right. on our radio show. But at the same time, this is a Bryce Miller appreciation shout out for that. And, <laughs> and, and it's more impressive that you looked into the future and knew it was an off day. That's right. Um, so good, good, good for you. I think we no, should get an off day sleep. tomorrow. I think so, too. <laughs> uh, go for it. Uh, I fully approved on my end. Um, you know, we'll get out and do a few things. I, I snuck out, you know, when the Padres played late. Dennis Lynn and I well, I went to the, you know, the biggest uh, palace here in Seoul and walked those grounds. And then there's a traditional Korean neighborhood that's that's famous here. And we visited that. And um, today, planning on, you know, hopefully on Friday, I'm going to go to uh, the DMZ. But just let me know if you want me to get some kimchi and bring it back. I'm happy to do it. We do. We want that for sure. Bryce Miller, thank you so much for joining us live from Korea. Get back in bed. Go to sleep. We appreciate your time. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right, everyone. That wraps up Annie and Elston for this Monday afternoon. Craig is back tomorrow for Braden Supranant. I'm Annie Heilbrunn. Thanks for joining us.